couple hours, we're going to start now something completely different. Now for something completely different. This is Dr. Frank Tambori, uh, host here at the Freedoms Phoenix uh, podcast. And for those of you that are just listening to this show uh, right now, uh, I'll be speaking about prostate cancer. And for, the, for those of you that listen to the show regularly, it might be a little, <laughs> a little off because you're used to hearing me talk about politics. And just like it's a little odd for me, uh, the same thing for me to be in Ernie's uh, chair talking about prostates. But I'm going to give you a little window into what I do, uh, not to be a commercial, but to teach some of you about maybe your own bodies and about uh, about your own prostate situation. Uh, most of, or many people who listen to conservative radio or, or libertarian radio and uh, those of us that are activists and such, for some reason we kind of skew uh, older men. And that is why you see so many commercials or, or hear them on the radio for you know, Prostate Forte, Prostate Plus, Super Beta, Prostate. You hear about all these commercials, uh, or, you know, treatments for erectile dysfunction. You know, hey, boys, don't be striking out in the bedroom and this kind of thing, and I, I cringe when I hear these. But, you know, uh, that is the market, and many of you might have similar uh, problems or situations. So uh, I, I, will, I guarantee you will learn something today about your prostate. We'll talk quickly about what it does and what the concerns are uh, for prostate cancer and the other two concerns for the prostate, which are BPH and prostatitis. And then, and if, and then also we'll, ter- we'll tie all this together by talking about the one lab test that most of you uh, probably, if you're listening to this podcast right now, probably you've heard of, and that is called the PSA. PSA is a lab test. Uh, it's called the prostatic specific antigen. And this is the, this whole problem boils down to this PSA test because this PSA test is, you know, it's run during your regular general practitioner exam. You know, when you get your cholesterol done and your sugar and your annual update, when you turn 40 or older, your doctor, whether you're aware of it or not, typically does, or at least they should, run this PSA test in the background, okay? And they may not talk to you about it. And when the results come back, unless it's elevated, they probably will not even mention it to you. You know, they'll just say, oh, your cholesterol's up a bit. Put you on some Lipitor. Have a nice day, right? That sort of thing. But if this lab test is elevated, and we'll talk about what these numbers are a little bit later, if it's elevated, that is a possible sign or a possible indication that you could, could, again, big C could here, have prostate cancer. And uh, the average doctor doesn't know how to handle this. The minute they hear cancer, the other C word, um, you know, doctors kind of wig out. They don't want the liability problem, and they will typically refer you to a urologist. Now, a good doctor might uh, retest your PSA a few months later and see what happens. But if it's a bit elevated, which according to the system, the man, the government, the, the insurance companies, and the lab, the cutoff is 4.0. Now, we're going to really break down that number and tell you what the real numbers are, uh, unofficial numbers, later on here in this podcast. But I'm giving you the long or short about what this prostate problem is. If the PSA is over 4, then it's black on your lab sheet. Doctor doesn't know what to do, and they will send you off to a urologist. And if a urologist sees that number... Remember, they have five minutes with you. They're not going to spend any time to figure out why your PSA might be up. They just go with the assumption that, well, it's cancer till proven otherwise. And then they want to do a biopsy. And they will conduct a biopsy where they take 12 needles. They shove it through your rectum. Uh, sounds like fun, I know. Uh, and they put 12 needles through the rectum, which is, of course, just coated in E. coli bacteria and other things and uh, basically pepper your prostate with it as they pull out cores of your prostate to look under a microscope to determine if legally there is a cancer there or not. And then also, by looking with the microscope, they can determine the cellular metabolism rate, and then they give it a score called a Gleason score, which lets you know legally, and again, on this show, the word legal is a whole different connotation, and we'll, we'll break this apart later, but technically and legally, what the aggression level is. And that word aggression, we're going to talk about, because the aggression, what you think aggression means as a patient or a listener, is not, I repeat, 
not what your doctor thinks about aggression. So patients and doctors are having two different conversations about the word aggression. So now what you have is a patient going through life, playing golf, uh, seeing their GP. You know, then they come up and they, they give you a call on the golf course, I guess, by the nurse saying, hey, you know, your cholesterol's a bit high and this and that, and your, this PSA thing is high. You should come on in and talk to your doctor. And then that leads to a urologist referral. The urologist puts a finger up there behind and feels the prostate and says, well, I don't know, kind of feels a little big here, but, you know, just to be sure, the PSA is a little elevated. Let's do a biopsy. Then they put a bunch of holes in it. And then if they find cancer, whether the entire prostate's full of cancer, which is you know, more rare, or if they just find one little itty bitty cell of cancer. And for you technical people out there, you could be less than 1% of one core Gleason 6. And that basically is a nothing burger type setup. We'll talk about that later. And, uh, you know, they'll say it's cancer doesn't matter how much it's cancer which to them is a liability issue so they they can't have a patient walking around with a cancer cell um, so they will tell you to remove it either through surgery or radiation they're very creative there's other ways you know they freeze it they fry it they nuke it they can use infrared they use all sorts of things you know uh, uh, ultrasound even with the high foo all sorts of different treatments to destroy the prostate to get rid of the cancer now some of you might be thinking well, that all seems to make sense, right? If there's cancer, then <laughs> you want to get rid of it. Well, yeah, but there is a big wrinkle here. And what the, what the million-dollar wrinkle is is this. A, we have found that we have cancer in us all of the time. I'm sure most of you have heard this. In fact, even Dr. Oz says this, right? We have cancer in us all of the time. So, uh, you know, I'm sure many of you have heard it. So, therefore, if someone finds prostate cancer, a couple cells in your prostate, what's the scandal? Right? I mean, if they found cancer, but we have it all the time, what's the problem? So the first issue is that many men have uh, start getting confused about whether cancer having it is a problem or not. Um, obviously, your doctors are concerned because it's a liability problem of you retaining the cancer. But wait, there's more. Here's the real, the, the real issue. And that is that there's only a one out of 40 chance with most prostate cancer diagnoses that you will ever die of the cancer. Let me repeat that, because that's sort of the crux of the problem, or half of the crux of the problem. And that is that most of us have cancer in us. Most men, if you live long enough, you're always going to, you know, if you biopsy you enough times, will always find prostate cancer to some degree. But most of that prostate cancer never kills the patient. There's only a one out of 40 chance. And, you know, those numbers are a little, a little debatable, but you get the idea. I mean, it's pretty much about run 140. It depends on some other criteria, but it's not what patients first think when they hear cancer. When you hear cancer, you think of, you know, your aunt, aunt Sally or someone that had breast cancer or pancreatic cancer. There were di a matter of fact, I'm speaking to you February, 2020 right now. And just two days ago, you know, uh, Rush Limbaugh, not to make this a political discussion for, for this podcast, but Rush Limbaugh was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. It's a perfect example. Um, you know, he didn't know he had it until he had some shortness of breath. He went to the doctor just a week or so ago, and they found stage four cancer. Well, that is not an, at all a good diagnosis, and uh, I do throw my, my wishes out to Rush, and uh, I will move on from there. But I, I will say that prostate cancer, when it's diagnosed, it's not like what happened to Rush Limbaugh. It's not like you get diagnosed and you have maybe six months or a year or a couple years. With prostate cancer, A, as I said, there's only a one out of 40 chance you're going to die anyway. And, and, and even if it is the type that could perhaps kill you, we're talking close to a decade or longer before such an early stage cancer diagnosis could eventually uh, you know, kill a patient. So within 10 years or longer, if at all, that is, those are pretty good odds for a lot of patients. So that's the other part to this is, well, if there is a cancer, do I have the kind that will kill me or not? And statistically, it won't. So that's pretty good on itself. All right. But wait, there's one more major problem to this a little narrative I'm, I'm bringing up to you that patients run into. Okay. We all have cancer all the time. So maybe that's not a problem. And then if they do find cancer legally and technically, most likely it's not going to kill you. And even if it's the type that can kill you, if it takes 10, 20 years to get you, well, then you probably might have died of something else anyway. I mean, most men are not diagnosed with prostate cancer. They're not diagnosed at 25. They're diagnosed when they're 60 or 70. Well, you know, let's be honest. I mean, depending on your life expectancy, uh, 10, 20 years, well, you know, 
A one out of 40 chance you might die in 15 years from a prostate cancer? Pretty good odds. You know, most guys are saying, hey, you know, <laughs> don't bother me again with this. But here's the issue. You might say, well, if it's one out of 40 chance, one out of 20 chance. Well, if it's, if it's cancer, if there's even a chance it could get me, why don't I just have the prostate removed or irradiated? And that's what your urologist wants. Well, you could. I mean, why not? If they find skin cancer on you, what, what are you going to expect the doctor to do? You remove the skin cancer. You know, you have a little scar. No problem. Or let's say, you know, even with a woman, if she has breast cancer, which is the most similar analog to prostate with men, is a woman's breast. And by the way, men can get breast cancer too. A lot of men don't know this. It's extremely rare, but they can die of breast cancer, and it's very lethal if you have it. But we're going to just go with the, the standard, you know, female breast cancer here. Um, you know, worst case scenario, uh, aside, assuming it doesn't become metastatic, you can remove the breast, right? You, you, you wind up conducting a mastectomy, often a, a double mastectomy. And, you know, it's not nice. Women don't want it. It represents femininity and, and, and other things. But they can at least reconstruct the breast, right? You can have, a, you can have a, you know, uh, an implants and such. So, and you still have sensation from the skin. You can still have sensation from the nerves. Um, the only thing you can't do for, for, with, with reconstruction, of course, is, you know, nurse a baby. But, you know, when women get breast cancer at age 50 or 60, they're probably not nursing any, any they're not nursing any babies. So with men, though, if they're, when they remove the prostate, it's not like you're going to get a scar, and it's not like you can just reconstruct. When you have prostate surgery, there is a 60 to 80% chance, and again, a lot of variabilities depending on your procedure, of permanent side effects, of true quality of life side effects, most namely erectile dysfunction. Now, this is a whole loaded topic in itself, erectile dysfunction, there's erectile insufficiency, you know, decrease in orgasm sensation, you know, dry orgasms, all sorts of things that can happen. And also, if that's not bad enough for men, uh, there's also the threat of being incontinent or some form of incontinence. You can have what's called stress incontinence, which is, you know, we just have a weak uh, valve uh, sphincter so, uh, of the bladder. So if you laugh at a joke, if you pick something up heavy, and you bear down your muscles, your rectal muscles. It's called a valsalva when you, when you do that movement. Um, some urine can, can squirt out. Some of you guys probably it happens already if you have a weak valve. That often can happen with a BPH. But anyway, you could have permanent uh, urine problems and urine leakage issues um, and uh, incontinence and erectile dysfunction. Those are pretty bad side effects with probably a 60 to 80% chance some of that will happen to you to some degree. But those side effects would, you know, are not so good and pretty prevalent, but all done for a cancer that has only a 1 out of 40 chance getting you. You see the quandary here. And I was a little long kind of setting that up, but some of you already get this, but some of you that are brand new maybe don't even understand the game of what the problem is. That's the problem. And men uh, in the beginning don't know this. They just, you know, if you don't understand this, then your doctor runs a PSA, you get a biopsy, they find cancer, they say, what are you doing next Tuesday? We'll rip it out or nuke it. And uh, most men just go along with the program and never look back. As far as they're concerned, their urologist saved their life, and perhaps they did, um, and they move on and they deal with the side effect, and, and that's fine. But when men happen to uh, uh, check out uh, the internet, this thing called the internet, um, <laughs> and they start going to chat rooms and they begin to communicate with other men, they quickly learn online what I just told you, that prostate cancer is not the, the, the bugaboo that people think it is. And uh, there's many options and they may, probably won't die and they want a choice. And that is what I provide. Uh, my practice, I'll talk about in, in, uh, um, in a moment, but I am not the doctor that conducts the surgery. I'm not the doctor that sells you a bunch of herbs, which I can. I mean, I teach the class on this, but uh, I, I'm not necessarily pushing treatments as much as what are we treating and should this be treated naturally or conventionally. Ultimately, I try to help men figure out you know, do you have the poodle or the pit bull? If you want quality of life, what's the chance that this thing will get you or not? Because if there's a low chance it'll get you and you really want quality of life, then maybe as a team, we can find a strategy of testing and keeping you safe where maybe you can truly outrun this cancer and never have to worry about it. 
Whereas, you know, on the other hand, you know, men say, look, I, I want quality of life. I just don't want to be stupid about it. And, uh, you know, the question for a lot of men is how long can I live with a prostate cancer before I have to do something about it? When do I have to, quote, pull the ripcord? The problem is, is when a guy says, well, just tell me when, when I'm supposed to. Just, you know, I, I, I want as many erections as I can. I want to enjoy my sex life. But, Doc, you just tell me when it's a problem. Well, the thing is, since doctors are worried about Goldberg and Osborne suing them all the time, then, therefore, if you're going to ask the doctor when to have this removed, guess when? Today. That's what they're going to tell you. Because they are not going to lose their practice because you sue them for not acting quickly enough and not removing the prostate cancer earlier because you want to have an erection. That's just the reality of it. They don't work for you. They work for the insurance companies, the government, and certainly, I'm sure, for their own best interests. So that is, uh, very quickly, the poker game or the, 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 the problem that men find out when they start pulling the thread from the sweater and they look online, they go down rabbit holes and recognize, OMG, what is going on? Who do I listen to? Because now, once you start to understand this dilemma, you realize that you're now pitted against two separate systems. It's sort of like our political system today. You've got the, you know, you got, you got the conservatives and the liberals and the whoever. You know, you've got the two extremes. Is you have the conventional doctors, you know, your your standard urologist, and then the alternative doctors on the other side, and they are playing a game that I call in my office prostate ping pong. You heard me right, prostate ping pong. And your prostate is the ball, and they're playing a game with it. And it goes back and forth, and you're in the middle trying to figure this out, and technically it's supposed to be about you. Uh, they usually forget about you, though. So on one hand, the conventional doctors say, you need to get a PSA to see if there might be a cancer there. But the alternative doctors say, don't trust the PSA. PSAs are not reliable. PSAs are often faulty. And they're correct. That is very true. Uh, many of you listening to me right now, I'm sure at least have heard this, that PSAs are not reliable, and that's true. But when are they reliable? When is the PSA telling you the truth? That is what I focus on, is I spend a lot of effort in my practice to figure out when you have a PSA that's elevated, I don't assume it's cancer, but I want to know where that PSA is coming from. And that's where the work comes in. Work is time, and time the medical system doesn't have. So prostate ping pong. Get a PSA, the other guy, the alternative guy says, don't trust it. Um, everything makes it go up. Then maybe the PSA is high and you decide to have a biopsy. They tell you to get a biopsy. And the, alter and the alternative doctor says, don't get a biopsy. Because if you do so, the uh, biopsy could spread the cancer throughout the prostate itself. That's a true concern that many men have, that it can spread the cancer. And they're more concerned it spreads it throughout the body. And therefore, the act of diagnosing the cancer, the concern out there is it could spread and you can die from it just from the biopsy. Now, let me be really clear. Um, the evidence shows pretty much overwhelming that prostate cancer cannot be spread throughout the body on a biopsy. Okay. Now, that's different than spreading the cancer throughout the prostate itself. That it very well might do. And, and, uh, and, and that's a little separate deal because if it spreads throughout the prostate, well, you might think it's a problem, but the urologists are not concerned. You see, if they do a biopsy and they don't find cancer, they didn't spread anything. Who cares? If they find a cancer on the biopsy, again, who cares if they spread it throughout the prostate itself because they assume that you're going to have the prostate removed next week anyway. So that's why doctors don't have a problem just biopsying, you know, your, your grandma, for instance, with a hangnail. Uh, trust me, they, they get a little itchy finger. They love the biopsy. But that, that's why they tend to, to do it. Um, the problem, though, is, is if you decide to hold on to your prostate and treat it naturally after a biopsy, well, now you may have taken one area of cancer and spread it to another within the prostate, which makes your job trying to heal it that much harder. Also, as we'll get to, if, you, if your PSA goes up not because of cancer, but it goes up because you rode a motorcycle or it, you have an infection of the prostate, and we'll go over all the things that can throw off this PSA, mainly inflammation. If your prostate's inflamed and that is the reason that your PSA went up and your doctor doesn't want to take the time to figure that out, he just wants to jump to the biopsy so he can't be sued for not doing it, well, guess what putting 12 holes through your rectum full of bacteria will do to that prostate? It will really inflame it. And then the PSA goes up even higher. And then the doctor says, oh, look at this. 
the PSA is getting higher. We've got to biopsy you again. Or if they do find cancer, even one little tiny cell of cancer may not ever kill you, but he will now, it, he will now equate the PSA, not just the original PSA, but the PSA that increases after the biopsy as coming from the cancer to make his case that you must have a bad cancer. Whereas maybe in reality, the cancer didn't worsen. It's just that you ticked off the prostate, put in holes in it. And maybe the whole thing could, be, could have been avoided by simply understanding why the PSA was high in the first place. I hope this makes sense for you guys. Um, now, uh, you know, some patients will say, well, well, maybe it's good if they found the cancer anyway. They found it by mistake. You know, okay, fine. I rode a motorcycle. My PSA went up because my prostate got inflamed. They found cancer uh, by accident, but at least they found it. Right, Doc? Well, we're right back to where we talked about. If there's only a 1 out of 40 chance that you, that's going to kill you, well, then, you know, do you really want to treat something that probably was sitting there all along, not, you know, just minding its own business, and now you might have side effects the rest of your life, you know, and, and have sexual performance issues every time that you see your partner um, because a urologist acted on the wrong numbers. That is the quandary that my men have. That is exactly the, the, this prostate ping pong game you guys are stuck in. So go back to the ping pong game. PSA, do it. The alternative guy says it's not reliable. Uh, then the, then the, if it's high, get a biopsy. You know, you know, the automatic biopsy, biopsy. The alternative guy says don't get it done. It's going to spread the cancer and you're going to die. And, of course, that's not really what happens. It might spread throughout the prostate itself. That's about it. It will not really spread throughout the, throughout, throughout the body. Now, some of you might be uh, challenging me on that point, but I can nix this whole concern that cancer is spread on a biopsy uh, throughout your body very quickly. And just, it's hard to do this over the video phone here or the, the mic over you know, my charts I have in my office, but just think about this. The prostate cancer diagnosis in this country spiked around 1980. You know, there was a flatlined uh, amount, you know, per, you know, how many you know, 100 men uh, would get prostate cancer. It's, on, it's, it's a bit elevated, but we knew the number of men that had prostate cancer, mainly because how many of them were dying from cancer. By the time that a man was diagnosed with cancer, it was stage four, like with Rush Limbaugh, with that example again. The cancer is already everywhere, and that's how they determined it. So by the time you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, you know, there's a good chance you would die from it unless, you know, you had a heart attack first or got run over by a Model T Ford back in the day. That's what would happen. But the reason that prostate cancer rates skyrocket, I mean like 11-fold, <laughs> went up in 1980, wasn't because Michael Jackson infected us with tarantism, which, by the way, <laughs> look that one up. That's hysterical. But it wasn't because of that. It's because of, that was the introduction of the PSA. It was developed in the 70s and then uh, instituted uh, through hospitals in the 80s. And when this PSA test, you know, your blood, when the PSA would go up, they would do an automatic biopsy. So suddenly, we were doing biopsies on all these men based off of this one number, which is not reliable to begin with. But then they would biopsy, and we would find cancer. Now, we found, here's, here's what's significant, we found multiple amount of cancer more than what was in the patient population that we knew at the time. In other words, in other words if uh, I'm just throwing out basic numbers here, I'm not going to get all the technicals, but if let's say 100 men uh, are diagnosed you know, per year with prostate cancer and you only wait until they're dying from it to find out, if you biopsy everybody, all of a sudden we're finding from a ratio perspective 1,000 men with prostate cancer, yet only 100 of them would die from it. So what did that suggest? it suggested that 900 of the men had prostate cancer that never would have killed them. Now, did this just happen in 1980 because the PSA was introduced? No. It suggests further that prostate cancer was in all of our ancestors. Now, how far back, you know, who knows? But let's say at least for the last couple hundred years, we could make, speculate, I think, rationally, that our ancestors, our great-great-grandparents, probably had prostate cancer and never knew about it and never died from it. A lot. Of, one reason, of course, is we died of things earlier, you know, in, you know, factory, you know, uh, accidents, and you know, of course, women of childbirth. You know, people died of uh, earlier on, and that's that's part of this. You know, we're living longer, so cancer can catch up to us. But but really, the fact is that most men never die of the prostate cancer. As I keep saying, uh, they die with it. But the biopsies that were done with everybody with a, with a high PSA began to, 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 to discover all of this cancer that was there all along. So the system, though, would remove the prostate. 
because they didn't know what else to do when you're diagnosed with cancer. They would remove it. And therefore, the death rate, the mortality rate of prostate cancer went down. And that is a fact. Prostate cancer support groups that are a little bit old fashioned, who still go by the, you know, PSA and biopsy everybody reflex model, which is kind of going away the way of the dodo, I have to admit. But people who still go by that standard will argue that doing a biopsy on every man with a high PSA over four, regardless, saves lives. And they make that claim, and they're correct technically. All right. Uh, the, the mortality rate went down about 15, 20 percent by doing this with everyone. So, you know, you do save lives. However, for every life that you've saved, you've probably destroyed 80 percent more lives because of unnecessary surgery to save that 10 to 20 percent. Again, that's debatable how much. Now, you might say, okay, well, at least, at least people's lives are being saved, but you have a huge quality of life problem. Remember, we're not removing the prostate and you just get a scar. You're removing the prostate with lifelong side effects. Okay, now I know most of you probably, I'm getting a little redundant at this point, but I hope you're, you're all with me understanding this big picture. But you might be wondering, okay, well, how is Dr. Tambor saying that biopsies don't kill patients prematurely by doing a biopsy and spreading the cancer? It's because of this. I just, I just told you the answer in different pieces. Let's put this together. Some of you, I think, already figured out what I was saying. And that is, if the biopsy spreads the cancer outside of the prostate, okay, the act of the biopsy itself, which then spreads and then you'll die from that, well, then, now that we've been biopsying everybody because of the PSA, often falsely, you know, being alarm bells, and we're finding all this cancer, a spike in all this cancer that didn't just occur in people. It's been there all along. Well, just the, the only way we diagnosed it was by doing biopsies, whether they were necessary or not. That's how we determined and diagnosed the cancer was on a biopsy. And so if we have this spike 11 fold in diagnoses because we're biopsying everybody. And if the biopsy spreads the cancer out outside the body to kill you, well, then wouldn't you see an increase in mortality of men with prostate cancer, not a decrease? And yet that's what we find, a decrease. So even, even with the biopsying of everybody, we have a decrease in mortality. And that is a fact, and that right off the bat puts a, you know, I guess doctors shouldn't say nail in the coffin. I did fail, by the way, the bedside manner class. <laughs> Some of you already know my personality, but I, I, I take what I do seriously when I'm in my doctor mode. But, but no, that, that kind of put the kibosh on the, this concern of it spreading everywhere. Now, with that said, I want to be clear. I am not in favor of unnecessary biopsies. I do my best to hold back like, uh, like the gong show, pulling back the unknown comic, you know, from hitting the gong. You know, I'm trying to help men not rush into a biopsy unnecessarily. You know, if you have a biopsy, don't have it done for, for your doctor's malpractice reasons. You know, have it done for your best interest and your reasons. And trying to figure out that line is basically what my job is and what I'm trying to give you guys some clues today to help figure out. All righty. So uh, before I uh, get further into this, um, oh, wait, let me finish the ping pong game. So I'm doing these in stages. So we talked about the ping pong game of the PSA. Both sides have different views. Then the biopsy. Both sides have different views on biopsy. Then we have, let's say you did get a biopsy and they do find cancer. The conventional system says, well, you need to rip it out. And the alternative size set, uh, alternative doctors will say, don't have prostate surgery because most men don't die from it. Instead, they want to sell you a bunch of, uh, you know, expensive salt palmetto and, you know, salt palmetto has its place, but they, they treat you all naturally and IVs and all the rest. But, you know, the, do the doctors are scaring you that you're going to die from this. And the alternative doctor says, don't worry about it. Chances are you're not. So much so that some alternative doctors, I think, are a bit unethical because they play the odds. In other words, if you know your patient only has a one out of 40 chance of dying from it, I could sell you overpriced Krispy Kreme donuts that I pretend are a cancer treatment. And say, so, oh, yeah, $100 a donut. This is, this is anti-cancer. And then when you don't die of prostate cancer, then I can claim success. And I can charge the next patient $200 because I saved your life and you didn't die of prostate cancer. You see how this goes? Trust me. 
both sides have a racket going. The conventional doctors have it because, you know, their the insurance problems and their liability and they care about themselves, not you. And the alternative doctors, um, uh, not that they're all scam artists, trust me. Most of them have the best intentions. But sometimes, whether it's out of ignorance or they just don't know or they do take advantage, they play the odds. So what is a patient to do when you're caught in this ping pong game? Some of you guys throw your hands up in the air and you figure, I don't know who to listen to. Do I have a problem or not with this PSA? Well, then you turn to uh, Dr. Wikipedia and Nurse Google online. And then you go down the rabbit hole. Uh, if It's like, like the political uh, rabbit hole, but this is with prostate cancer. And then you guys get way overwhelmed because if you thought that, those, that ping pong game was confusing, there's many, many others, uh, depending who you listen to. And many men just throw their hands up and say, I can't deal with this. Um, eventually, though, uh, doctor after doctor, uh, patients will often get referred to me um, as a uh, referral source, mainly because I don't advertise. It's all word of mouth, and it's only through doctors that understand this problem, um, and they recognize that I can help figure out where on the bell curve they are. Are they a candidate really for surgery? Is it in their best interest or natural treatments? And if so, if it's conventional treatments, how aggressive do the surgeries need to be? Because, you know, some surgeries make sure to get most of the cancer, but they give you more side effects. They have to cut the nerves, let's say, which means you have no erections. Whereas you can also have surgeries where they don't cut the nerves and there's fewer side effects, but the quid pro quo is there's more of a chance that some of the cancer might be left behind. You see, everything's a yin and yang. How much certainty do you know that you got the cancer versus side effect profile? And then on the other hand, you know, if you choose natural treatments over conventional, well, then same thing. You know, how aggressive, quote unquote, is the problem? If it's not very aggressive and most likely you'll, you'll outlive this cancer, well, you could probably get by by changing your diet and uh, taking maybe salt palmetto and a multivitamin. I'm just throwing some things out. They're very basic, pretty cheap. But if you have... You know, if you have a, you know, a Gleason 8 cancer or Prozilla problem and, uh, you know, this is something that you have a cancer that might be trying to jump out of the exit soon, well, you might have to be doing IVs a few times a week at 200 bucks a pop and, you know, maybe four or five bottles of supplements that could be 50 or $60 a bottle for years, maybe the rest of your life. Now, I'm not the one normally selling this to patients. Uh, remember, most of my men fly in to see me, and I, I don't treat them when they fly in. I let their local referring doctor treat them. That way, patients trust me, and they don't think I'm trying to upsell them a bunch of supplements like, 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 like their local chiropractor or naturopath, which, you know, I, I respect them, but uh, that's what they, where they make their money, and I don't want ever to be thought of in, that, in those terms. So, you know, but guys are not sure who to listen to at that point. So that's the prostate ping pong game, and that's why men will, will come in, and pretty much uh, they will come in with their wives. We have, a, we have a couch. They sit down, and we go over all of your information. We go over all of your PSAs, not just your most recent PSA, but all of your PSAs. If you can go back 30 years, I look at all of them. Like an Austrian economist that I tend to be, I don't look at one CPI or, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, or, or, or a, a, a GDP number and make a decision off the economy off of one number, no. You look at patterns over time. And similarly, that's what I do with PSAs. I don't look at one number that your doctor's all worried about. I want to know what that number has been doing before. Okay, and uh, you know that means a lot so to figure out where the PSA has been, where is it going, you know, what is it relative to? I'll just give you a few examples. You know, if your PSA, maybe it's five, you know, which is uh, you know, a little bit elevated. Well, it means a big difference if last year it was 4.9 or last year it was 0.9. You see, going up 0.1 is different than going up three, four points in a year. That, that, those are two completely different risk problems, even though the number today is, is, is five. It's the same number on paper. It means different things. If your PSA went up and you have many urination symptoms, that is completely different. Then if your PSA elevates and you don't have any symptoms, you know, a patient wants to brag to me that they pee as if they're 25 and they can write their name in the snow. You know, you, people think they're, 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 uh, they're impressing me, but believe it or not, if your PSA is high and you do not have symptoms, that is more worrisome because prostate cancer is insidious. You don't know you have it. And that's what throws a lot of guys off. The better health that they're in, they don't understand why the PSA could be a problem. Uh, what else with PSA? Well, we talked about how quickly it's going up. We're talking about symptoms with PSA. What else? Well, how about the PSA pattern? 
The pattern is very important. Um, we'll get into this in, in, in just a bit, but there's three main reasons your PSA can go up, basic categories. Prostate cancer, B BPH, which we'll just say is a big prostate. That's not really what it means, but for argument's sake, a large prostate. Um, so if you have a large prostate, you have more cells. If you have more cells, you have higher PSA because each cell makes PSA naturally. Um, and then there's prostatitis, which is an inflammation of the prostate, you know, and, and, you know, you have inflammation or infection, these sorts of things, riding a Harley Davidson, all of these things make an inflammation. Well, what would the PSA do? You see, prostate cancer, if the PSA goes up and, you know, everything being equal, the PSA tends to be more of a staircase. So it might have two steps forward, then one step back, two steps forward, one step back. And if you have enough data, then you can start to see this type of pattern. Now, there's, I'm definitely simplifying this, but that, you, get, you get the idea. The cancer advances a bit, and then it regroups. It advances and regroups and consolidates itself a bit. Okay? Now, and usually without symptoms. Now, BPH, um, if you have a gland that's slowly growing over time, and it's a standard rate, it's like your hair. Imagine your hair grows how much you know, every, every month or so. Well, your prostate, kind of like a, a, the, the, the rings in a tree that keep growing out, the prostate grows at a typically somewhat standard rate. Well, if it grows at a certain rate, if your prostate grows 10% in a year, well, then you're allowed to have a 10% increase in your PSA. So therefore, a PSA increase from BPH would be more of a linear curve a linear line, right? Just kind of a slow growth line commensurate with the size of your gland. Okay. And the third pattern would be prostatitis. If we're dealing with an inflammation, well, let's just keep it simple. Let's say an infection, which, which causes an inflammation. You know, your PSA is low, then all of a sudden you get an infection. Bam! You get all kinds of side effects and, and pain and pain when you urinate called dysuria and frequency and urgency and uh, hesitancy and all these symptoms hit you and you're peeing at night. That's a urinary tract infection. Bam, all these symptoms. Then we check your PSA, and your PSA triples. Bam, it goes up, you know, two, four points. And then you take antibiotics, the PSA drops, and your symptoms go away. So if symptoms go away, your PSA drops with it. Okay, that is, a, that is a classic sign of a prostatitis. Trust me, guys, the cases are never that simple. <laughs> well, they can be. But typically what I see are much more complicated and they're more nuanced. But I'm giving you more of a, like a medical school version of what to look for. So if the PSA sp sp spikes up and drops back down, especially if you have symptoms, that's usually not cancer. Cancer doesn't go up and down like that. It typically would be prostatitis. So therefore... You have three main conditions that can affect that PSA, and by looking at the PSA, tracking the PSA over time, you can best uh, you begin to narrow in, focus in on which condition it might be. And if it looks like it's prostatitis, well then, why do you need a biopsy to try to look for a cancer that most likely is not there? And even if it is, the cancer is not what made the PSA go up in the first place. It was inflammation. As I said earlier, you biopsy that inflamed gland, you're going to have a doubly inflamed gland that perhaps for months or years, and that will really throw off your PSA, including the PSA pattern that I, as your doctor, I'm trying to look at. What else can we do with PSA? What else can make the PSA go up or down or change it? Ah, here's the big one, no pun intended. Well, we said the size of your prostate, right? Um, that's called a, P uh, to be more technical, it's called a PSA density calculation. So that's where you take your, prost your PSA and you divide it by the volume of your prostate. So uh, there's certain values involved here, but if you're under a certain cutoff, then it's most likely BPH or not cancer. And if there is a cancer, the PSA itself is not that worrisome. And the higher the density calculation is, then it means that there's more PSA being made per cell in that gland, which means that some of those cells are producing, to, uh, to quote uh, Mr. Al Gore, more than their fair share. I always like that. More than their fair share. So some of these cancer cells, uh, or prostate cells, I, I should be specific, are producing more than their fair share of PSA. So that means it's not BPH, because BPH goes at a set rate. Instead, we're talking about a PSA that's going up by either cancer or maybe inflammation. So then how do you figure out between those two? Well, does the patient have symptoms? If the patient has symptoms, it's probably prostatitis. If they don't have symptoms, it's probably, BP, uh, 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 it's probably um, um, prostate cancer, unfortunately. So I just gave you a sense 
And hopefully I didn't lose you guys too much. I, I'm used to talking very detailed because my patients to see me are very educated by the time they find me. They've already been through this whole rat race. But I'm trying to, uh, for those of you that are new to this whole prostate issue or not sure what the concern is, I'm trying to show you, explain to you what the, what the concern of patients are. Uh, often is, and how I can use logic and deductional, you know, reasoning. Uh, it's like playing Clue, you know, Colonel Mustard with the candlestick in the internet cafe. You know, I'm, I'm trying to reduce down the options by looking at your symptoms and the size of the gland and the PSA pattern and what the rate of increase was, all of this uh, to help figure out what is the PSA telling me. So, that is a large part of what I do, is help men figure out what their PSA uh, 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 is communicating to us. <clears throat> I also will review the uh, biopsy reports. And, and if patients have had biopsies, I can explain to them what their doctors will not talk to them about uh, with biopsy. Um, so by reading the biopsy, is this a concerning cancer or not? You know, a patient says, well, is it aggressive? Well, aggression doesn't always tell you the full story, and we're gonna, we'll, we'll talk about aggression, I guess, in a moment. But before I do, I, I just want to, to just pull back and, and give, you some, um, give you a resource for those of you that uh, just like to get more information about this ping, prostate ping pong game. There's a book called Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers. Okay, Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers. Fun, quirky title, I know. Uh, and that is available on Amazon or anywhere. And no, I, I don't make a dime off it. I, it's not my book. But the cover is very nice. It has a cover of both a surgeon's hand, you know, with a gloved hand, and a, a businessman's hand, you know, like, like with, with wearing the, guys, the guys wearing a ring. And they're, they're at odds. They're punching each other. It's like uh, the fist bump, like Rocky IV, right? <laughs> and, and that's what it is. And that, that's pretty much what I deal with, the prostate ping pong game. In this case, the conventional system, the alternative doctors and the layman, the surgeon that wants your prostate out, the alternative guy, uh, the, the, the patient that doesn't. And how do you navigate this? That book is required reading for patients to come see me or for I recommend for other you know, doctors to tell their patients. Remember, I'm not trying to make this a commercial as, as much as it might sound it. But I, but I just want you to be aware that's a fantastic resource for you to learn from a patient's perspective this, this, this game that you'll be thrust into. Okay, so you hear it from both sides and you understand, you understand the rules of this game and where you're being placed into it. Because if you don't, then you will be treated like a piece of cattle going down the cattle chute, being prodded and being told, do this, do that. PSA is over four, get a biopsy. Oh, they find something, blah, blah, blah. And you wake up one day without a prostate, without an erection, going, what the hell just happened to me? And without any choices or options given to you. That is the concern. Now, what options do you have with, with um, uh, if, if it is diagnosed? Well, um, one option is, is surgery radiation, and that's what we're trying to avoid for the reasons I mentioned. The other is called active surveillance. That's what most of my men are trying to do. They learn and realize quickly that having cancer is not really the problem. I mean, in the beginning, when you're new to this, you know, anytime you hear the C word, you flip out and you become Jimmy Stewart, you know, in vertigo, you know, and goes, woo, <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock's famous rack pull, you know, he did as, as director. And, uh, you know, the background slips away and you, your eyes are like saucers. And, and I, I certainly understand and respect that. And you don't know what's happening and am I going to die soon and all of this. But the thing is, men, uh, if you have a PSA under 10 or 20 even, there's no way, let me be up front with you, there's no way you're going to die of prostate cancer in most cases um, in a year, two years, three years. It takes prostate cancer close to a decade to kill you if the cancer even gets out. Remember, most men die with it. Prostate cancer can only kill you if it gets out of the prostate. This is an extremely important point to understand. Again, some of these points I just take for granted because my patients already know this coming in, but I think many of you maybe don't know this. Prostate cancer, since we die with it, most of us, it means that, you know, it's been in us for decades. It doesn't do anything. So how does a cancer eventually kill you? Well, it only kills you if it gets out of the prostate. It just staying in the prostate. It's just hanging out. You know, it grows. It can get big. Uh, you know, now technically a prostate cancer can kill you, if, if it stays in the prostate in a very unique situation, and that is if the cancer gets so big that it blocks your urethra, 
you know, if it blocks the, the urethra, well, then like BPH, having a large prostate, um, you know, you can't pee. And if you can't urinate, then the urine backs up the bladder, which backs up into the kidneys. You get pollen, pollen, you'll get a hydronephrosis. And then the kidneys begin to shut down because they can't filter any of the blood going through it into urine. And therefore, as you, as your fluids are in you, if they can't be excreted through the kidney system, aside from sweating out fluid and some fluid that goes through, through the stool, possibly, um, the fluid backs up. And, and with, 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 with hydrodynamics and the pressure of fluid, it backs up the heart, and you'll have a heart attack. That's actually what happens. I mean, if you can't pee at all, eventually the you know, heart shuts down. So, so it's a serious thing if you, can't, if you can't urinate. But that is the only way that prostate cancer could technically kill you if it stays in the prostate. Now, I know for most men, that's not what they're thinking of. When they think of prostate cancer killing them, they're thinking of, you know, cancer that spreads all over their body and in their brain and different places. And I understand that. That is how most men are concerned. And by the way, how does cancer kill you in the first place? I'll bet you many of you have never even thought about this. You know, you think you know on the surface, but how does cancer really kill you? It's sort of like asking, you know, what is the color green? You know, or, you know, asking some really obvious question, like when you think about, it, well, what is green? <laughs> like, what is it? You know, it seems so simple to think about it. Well, what, how does cancer kill you? This is, a, this will be worth the price of admission just for this alone. How does it kill you? It's not, you know, some people think cancer is just this evil cell that, that it's like cyanide, you know, and if you have it in you, it just somehow just kills you, it just turns off your body. That's not what it does. Cancer is, is really another life form. And, and I've learned to respect cancer, it's just like bacteria, virus, fungus, you know, our own cells. You know, it, it, it's, it's a life form in itself. And there's reasons I say that. I mean, has, the, cancer cells have their own, their own personality. Matter of fact, prostate cancer, there are over 1,000 different types of prostate cancer. Over 1,000 different types. So when patients come in, they say, Dr. Tambori, I was just diagnosed with prostate cancer. Of, so what do you think I should take? What about salt palmetto? <laughs> you know, I mean, I think it's one size fits all. It's like saying, you know, what, what, what flavor uh, ice cream does, 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 you know, does, does, uh, what will your nephew like? I mean, I don't know. I mean, chocolate, vanilla, tutti, fruity, pistachio, who knows? Well, the same thing here. These cancers are different. There's different personalities. But anyway, um, prostate cancer or, or any cancer uh, kills you in a, in a way that people don't realize. Think of it this way. Well, basically how it kills you is that a cell that is growing in an area it doesn't belong. And by doing so, it disrupts the, 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 the processing or the functionality of that area of the body. Okay? So if your brain is trying to work and some other cells are growing in your brain that are taking the place of cells that are trying to do a job then eventually the brain can't work or your liver or something else. It's like, it's like you're, imagine being at your job, whatever job that you do, and you have an efficient, hopefully efficient office, whatever that you do, right? And there's a certain efficiency. Well, imagine if your child comes to work. You know, I have a two-year-old now. So imagine your child comes to work. It, you know, the kid's making noise, running around from room to room. It's harder for me or for you to do your job with a two-year-old running around. You could probably still do your job, but it's a distraction, right? All right? You might be able to handle it. You have your, one of your front desk people try to handle your kid and you know, put, put the kid in the break room. That's like your immune system. Your immune system's kind of you know, trying to tidy up and take control of some of these, these loud people or kids running around. But now imagine a second kid shows up and a third kid. Think about how hard and harder it is for you to do your job, right? That's what starts to happen. Eventually, you start making mistakes at your job. You start getting late at your job, and, and your job becomes less efficient. And, you know, you might be able to still do your job, but eventually, if the preschool opens up into your office, <laughs> you might have to shut the office down because you can't get anything done. That is what, how cancer get, uh, starts to get you. But we have one other criteria, and that is how does cancer, is, is that it depends uh, what organs affect it. And this is an important point because many of you get concerned about cancer because you hear about someone who's diagnosed and they die in six months or so. And you, you, that's how patients understandably think cancer is. You're diagnosed and how many months do I have, doc? Right. Well, but then you also hear about people who are diagnosed 
and they live for years and years and years with the cancer and they don't seem to die from it. And from a patient's point of view, it's very disconcerting. I mean, it's nice to know that, you know, not everyone dies from it right away, if at all. But it's the mercurial nature of it. It's the inconsistency of it for a layman. You know, you, you don't know what you're dealing with. You know, I mean, first they seem deadly, then they seem okay. And there is, it's hard to understand what the difference is. Well, I'm just explaining to you now what the difference is. It's not only do you have a thousand different personalities of prostate cancer, let alone other types of cancers, but it depends if the cancer got out of the organ of origin. And if it stays in the prostate in this example, it's not going to kill you unless it blocks the prostate. Another example of the functionality of the gland uh, being interrupted. But let's use this example. If the prostate cancer does leave the prostate, now it's called metastasis. It's metastatic. It's left the organ of origin. And now that could become a threat to disrupt other organ systems, like the example I gave, and you can die from that. But let's, let's spin the roulette wheel, okay? And this prostate cancer, or whatever cancer, lands in your big toe, okay? Well, I mean, how's it going to kill you in your big toe? So you've got prostate cells. Imagine taking a piece of your prostate and, and suturing it onto your toe. It sounds silly. I'm not trying to make light of this, but, but how much is that really going to affect you? I mean, to be serious, maybe it throws off your, your gait maybe a little bit, depending on where it is. Maybe it's hard to get in the shoes. You have to buy special shoes. But that's, you know, it's not going to kill you. If that cancer grows uh, on, on the edge of your nose, it's, it's not going to kill you. If it stays on the edge of your nose, I mean, you know, you might have a hard time getting a date. But it, it's not going to kill you being on your nose. If that cancer cell or a piece of your prostate, you know, which is cancer in this case, but if a piece of your prostate is growing on the edge of your eye. Well, it's not going to kill you, but you can't see now. The functionality of the eye is now messed up. And the more it grows, the less you can see. All right, well, then how does it kill you? Well, it depends if the cancer lands somewhere that is necessary for, for, for daily function. If the cancer lands in your liver and certain parts of your liver, takes over enough of your liver where you can't where it disrupts the system and you can't metabolize uh, you know, the foods and medicines that you're taking, then your body quickly becomes toxic. You could become you know, acidic, what's called, what's called acid. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, my brain's gone here today. Uh, acidosis. It's called a metabolic acidosis. So you can run into this problem where you become highly acidic and then your enzyme systems don't work anymore. Or let's finish this part up. What if the cancer lands in your brain? And it lands at the back of your brain with vision, you'll have vision problems. If it lands in the, you know, the, the, the you know, base part of your brain that the, the we suppose you don't use much anyway, you may not even notice it. But if that cancer cell or group of cells lands and grows at the basal ganglion of your brain or the substantia nigra, these are the areas of the reptilian part of your brain that control respiration. So if you're interrupting the part of your brain that allows you to breathe, well, you'll die. And that is why there's so much confusion uh, and th different threat levels and randomness to this, because it does depend on where the cancer lands, okay? But once it does land, it usually takes years and years for it to grow to the point to disrupt the systems I just got done talking about. One cell that lands somewhere isn't going to do that. It takes years of this. But most people don't know until it disrupts the system enough that you notice a problem like Rush Limbaugh again. Had no idea. That stage four, he's had this lung cancer for years and years. No surprise. You know, he loves his cigars. But it wasn't until he had difficulty breathing that brought him into the doctor. He wasn't even coughing blood or anything. So, so that shows you how, how long this can go. And uh, one second here as I'm talking to you, my, we have our microphone or the headphones went out. Just one second. All right. So that's, that's the concern. So where it lands and how much is what we need to be aware of. Now, here's what I tell patients. For any of you listening that are even thinking about there might be a cancer problem, let me tell you the best news up front, or at least encouraging news. Most of the prostate cancer diagnosed, we're finding out now, doesn't even have the potential to kill you. The majority, far majority, 70 to 80% of prostate cancer diagnosed is what's called a Gleason 6 cancer. That's the lowest aggression cancer. And this is cutting edge information, guys, not meant to be uh, put on the loudspeaker. Uh, doctors aren't ready to admit this yet, 
and this is not me, this is like you know, Mayo Clinic docs and, and urologists at conferences saying this. We believe that Gleason 6 cancer that has been removed and surgically removed for you know, generation or so of men, we now think may not even be cancer. That's right. That Gleason 6 cancer may not even be a true cancer, and they believe it's never, it's possible it's never killed a man ever. That sounds pretty hyperbolic almost. I sound like some kind of quack saying this, but this is not me. This is the conventional doctors that are starting to, to come around to this. The problem is, is that why do the, you know, is why do, why can a, a low Gleason 6 cancer turn into a Gleason 7 or 8 cancer and upgrade or transmutate into a more worrisome cancer, and then that can maybe get you. That's where the concern is. But um, if a cancer is higher than Gleason 6, which is rarer than having a 6, then the, the question is, can the cancer get out or not? Can it escape the prostate? If it does escape the prostate, then you start the clock of about 10 years or longer to live. Okay, you put it this way. Once the cancer gets out, you have five years before you even know you have a problem. Again, the Rush Limbaugh case. Five years, you won't even know. And then by the time you do find some symptoms, usually it could be uh, um, back pain uh, with prostate cancer. It tends to be like lower back pain, arthritic pain, um, being tired. And by the way, guys, I know you guys, oh, my God, my PSA is 3.5 or PSA is 10. And I do have a back pain. Oh, my God, I was working out in the garden and my back hurts and I'm tired a lot. And no, 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 no. Just don't, please, <laughs> you know, don't, don't, don't assume, you know, oh, I've got metastatic cancer. It's all over my body. You know, chances are, no, not at all. Uh, okay. But, but in time, though, that's those are the symptoms that can bring a patient to the doctor. And often it is misdiagnosed. They think it's an arthritis or you're just getting you know, old and slowing down. But what's going on is the cancer spreads from the prostate to your lower spine because the, your lower spine is right next to the prostate. When it gets into the spine, it might take years and years to whittle its way through your bone, getting into the bone marrow. And you, you know what the analogy is? A cavity of your tooth. Okay, you can have a cavity on your tooth for years. And not even know it. Now, you know, now, your dentist knows when he looks at it, but you wouldn't know. And maybe five years later, the cavity or longer gets, it get, works through the enamel slowly, gets into the bone marrow. I'm sorry, gets into, gets into the pulp of the, of the tooth. And then, you know, then you have pain. You have an infection. And, you, and then, of course, you go to the dentist. You go, what? Why does my tooth hurt so much? And you have to get a root canal. Right? That's pretty much uh, the, the, the same sequence. So prostate cancer will take years after it gets out to even grow maybe on your bone and get large enough to then penetrate the bone and then get into your bone marrow. And then what does your bone marrow make? Red blood cells. That's what bone marrow makes. Stem cells. That's why all the stem cell research you hear about is using people's own bone marrow. Well, um, well the bone marrow makes red blood cells. Red blood cells carry oxygen. And if you don't have red blood cells, you become anemic and you become tired. So that is why advanced prostate cancer over time, you know, you start having PSAs that are in the, you know, there are 40, 50, 100, this sort of thing. And then uh, you can start to have, you know, arthritic pain or bone pain, and then you become tired. And now you understand the, the reasons. But if you're tired because you're anemic, because of uh, the bone marrow being eaten up, well, guess what also you should have? decreased red blood cells and you would know your red blood cells would be off and your local doctor would already have picked that up early stage so that's why i just wanted to let you guys some of you know that are already concerned thinking oh my gosh i've missed that cancer no 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 but once the cancer gets out like i said five years till you even know there's a problem then you have five or more years undergoing standard treatments things like radiation and hormone ablation treatment and these are treatments that are not we're not talking chemotherapy and you're in a hospital and you're vomiting from chemo and losing your hair. And that's what you think of when you think of stage four cancers. That's what, unfortunately, Rush Limbaugh is probably going to be dealing with. That is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about treatments that are at the strip mall, you know, radiation centers that pop up like, like, like Starbucks. Some of you may, I'm sure a lot of you already know what I'm talking about. You know, you take your wife, your girlfriend, you go out, you have lunch, then you swing by the radiation center. You know, usually you do a 30 or 40 weeks of this or 30 or 40 sessions you know, over like 20 weeks or so. 
and you show up and you, you check in, you say hi to, to, uh, you know, to Denise at the front desk, and you say, hi, Denise, hi, hey, how you doing there, Carl? What's going on? And uh, you check in, you put on a gown, you lie in this machine, you, you have MTV playing on the screen, you don't feel anything, you're in and out in 10, 15 minutes, they just zap you and you don't even feel it, you walk out, then you take your wife out to see a movie, then you catch dinner, and you call it a day. And you do that a few times a week. It's just part of your routine. That's what we're talking about. Now, I'm not trying to undermine this and candy coat it. Trust me, I do everything trying to keep patients from going down that direction. But this is a far cry of what patients are concerned about. You know, when they think they're going to die immediately if there's something there. So clearly that, that, that's not the case. So chance that there's a cancer if your PSA is high is really the, is low. You know, it doesn't usually mean it is cancer if the PSA is high. Then if they do a biopsy, uh, the chance of finding cancer is not always certain. Then if they find cancer, the chance it's going to be anything over a Gleason 6, which is the kind that could try to get you, is rare. It's only 20% or 25% of cancers are over a Gleason 6. And so if it is a, a 7 or 8 or 9, you know, a higher Gleason, then that still doesn't mean the cancer is going to get out. That cancer could stay there for years, decades before it gets out. Many of them never get out. So you might outlive it anyway. And maybe if the cancer does get out with all of these, these, you know, these possibilities and you can see how it, it, it stacks up about how rare or more, let's just say more uncommon it is the cancer will get out. And if it does get out despite all of that, you still have 10 years. You have five years till you even know there's a problem. Then another five years of these treatments that are not as bad as the patients often think. I mean, you still have a, a life. You're still traveling the world and, you know, you, you're still active and it's not like you're bedridden. And then 10 years after the cancer gets out, if it ever does, that is when the fight begins. That is when you might become the Rush Limbaugh case. Sorry, Rush, I keep using his example just because it's in the news now, but I think it's, uh, it's apropos at this point. That's when the fight begins, okay? But keep in mind also, we're talking how many of these if this, if this, then that, this sort of thing. Well, we're talking, we're not talking 35-year-old, you know, men. We're talking people who are often 60, 70. And not that I'm playing Logan's Run, guys. I'm not putting you out the pasture and saying you're, you know, you're, you know, your 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 odometer's up already. Your warranty's up. That's that's not what I'm saying here, guys. You know, good Logan's Run a reference, by the way. You know, Farrah Fawcett's her first movie. But uh, you know, it, it it doesn't mean it's it's end of days. Um, you know, but if you're already 65. You know, and maybe your life expectancy is 10 years. You know, your parents all died, at, you know, in their 70s, maybe early 80s, you know, and you look at your own health. Do you have diabetes? Is the person obese? Do they have other health problems? You know, you got to put all that together. Chances are, even if the cancer does get out and you got 10 years, you're probably going to die of something else anyway. Matter of fact, this is, a, this is a fact. This is a fact, actually. The number one cause of death of a man with prostate cancer is a heart attack. Swear to God, that's what it is. Number one cause of death. There's more chance that you're going to die of a heart attack than the prostate cancer. And this is so true that urologists uh, have a joke, which I know, A, you know, doctors aren't supposed to joke, although, again, I failed that bedside manner class. And, and um, urologists, uh, many doctors don't have much of a sense of humor. <laughs> Maybe that's on purpose. They're better doctors. But the reason um, uh, the, 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 these... these uh, is that is the, the joke is, is that the number one drug to give a man with prostate cancer is Lipitor. And I say that and patients say, well, I didn't know the Lipitor was good for prostate. No, it's, it has nothing to do with prostate cancer. It's the fact that it'll help your blood cholesterol go down, your blood pressure, and you won't die of a heart attack, you know? So, so that, that gives you a sense. Hopefully, any of you listening this long, and uh, if you're listening to this podcast, you, something maybe sparked your interest. Uh, you know, maybe a, a loved one or yourself have a high PSA, and you're wondering, you know, do, do I have is an emergency? Is there a problem? Um, the system wants to make you think that there's a problem and an emergency because they have nothing else to offer. You know, all they know is, you know, biopsy, and if they find cancer, rip it out because they don't want to take the time to tr and, and the risk of tracking you over years. And if the cancer does get out, well, then you've got this whole other sequence of events I was talking about of timetables. And they don't want the cancer to get out because technically you could die from it when it gets out. Um, and then you can sue the doctor if they didn't pull it out early enough. 
And by the way, there's one other component to this. If it takes 10 years or longer to get you, if it even does get out, that also, guys, does not pull it, put into account two other factors. One is doing natural treatments. Remember, we're talking about the average patient. I mean, the patients we see, I mean, they're radically changing their diet. They're using, you know, different medications and serenoarepins and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors and other types of, 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 uh, of meds. Um, Proscar, Avidart, Finasteride, Dutasteride. I mean, these are, these are drugs that can help limit and slow down cancer. Um, uh, but anyways, other options. Naturally and then conventionally. And not only do we have Proscar and Avidart that are being used to help kind of quell prostate cancer, but there is a whole new breed of medications for advanced prostate cancer that are out. And I know because I'm the only naturopath that attends the, the, uh, the, the, the advanced, uh, 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 it's, the, uh, it's basically the active surveillance group. It's sort of the, the main integrative uh, urologist conference that's held in Hollywood every year. Called, it's called the PCRI Group, Prostate Cancer Research Institute. And it's a, a place where uh, a, a, a educated laymen who are part of prostate support groups go, urologists attend, MRI, you know, the physicians and, and, and technicians all show up to discuss this whole issue of active surveillance and prostate cancer and how to figure out all of this that I've been talking about. Because you can see how messy it is. It is much more complicated than, you know, oh, there's a black spot on your skin. Let's just cut it out and see if it's cancer. And if it is, well, we already took care of it. Have a nice day, at least hopefully. This is much, much more detailed, as I said, quality of life, longevity of life. What is cancer anyway? We have it all the time. What is aggression? What, is, what are the risks? So I'm, I'm kind of highlighting many of the points I've mentioned in the last, I guess, hour of been yapping um, to give you a sense of how detailed this can be. It's, it is a little overwhelming at first, but the good news is it shows you that this is not one size fits all. A diagnosis of a high PSA or even of cancer is not in any way uh, an automatic, oh my gosh, uh, if stage four, I'm going to die soon. Most likely never die from it. And if so, uh, it, you know, if there's a chance it could maybe get you, most likely you're going to outlive it anyway. And that's just the hard facts. All right. Normally, uh, when I'm giving talks like this, I'm sitting in front of a room full of, of other doctors or medical students or my patients. And usually I get feedback. So it's a little odd <laughs> being in the, the uh, Freedom's Phoenix zone <laughs> when normally I'm arguing with Ernie about things. And uh, I've, I've, I'm speaking in here on prostate. But um, I'm hoping most of you are with me so far who are interested in this topic. But let me, uh, now that you understand the big picture, the poker game, the problems, and, and the, uh, the good solutions, you know, the fact that all these new medications are coming out, chance of you dying is fairly low. Um, I don't want you also to just say, oh, I guess PSAs aren't reliable. I'm not going to bother because Dr. Tambori said I'm not going to die from it. A, that's not what I'm saying for obvious reasons. A, I'm not your doctor unless you're coming to my office, but I'm not going to give that type of medical advice. But the, the, the reality is, what I've told you is true, and any urologist that you know worth their salt will acknowledge everything I'm saying. Now, <clears throat> let's t let's step back into um, talk about something else here with as far as the prostate cancer. I'm going to talk about the basic lab values. Some of you are listening because your PSA is considered high, and you're trying to figure out is it really high or not. Yeah, I've talked about worst case scenario about where this thing can go, but for some of you, you know, uh, you know, you're probably looking at your labs and you're saying, well, do I have a problem or not? Well, I cannot technically legally tell you if you have a problem or not i'm just talking as a general doctor not your doctor okay i hate to bring all the legalities into it i sound like those <laughs> you know all those disclaimer people which i can't stand but you already get the gist so let's talk about psa values so the psa prostatic specific antigen has a legal technical cutoff of 4.0 Okay, if you look at your lab, those of you who have your labs, it's 4.0. It's either under 4 or over 4. Under 4, they say it's good, have a nice day. Your, D, your typical GP physician probably won't even mention it to you because if it's not black, they don't bring it up typically. If it's over 4, then it's a problem, or at least technically, and they send you off to the urologist, which we talked about. That, my friends, is a binary way of looking at these numbers. In fact, medicine likes to look at many values binary, meaning black or white, up or down. It's under this, it's good. It's over that, it's bad. 
I mean, in some ways they have to because of managed care. Um, and the government loves it because of, and I'll try real hard not to get on my soapbox on this one, but the government loves it because they're trying to make medicine and turn it into an app for your damn phone. That's what they're trying to do. They think medicine is so simple because they want to make it reductionistic. And um, this is kind of a, a little quick aside on this, but you think about it, you know, if you're a politician or, or an insurance or regulator and you're trying to make medicine more efficient because it just seems broken, and people don't seem to understand it became broken when the government got involved in this a long time ago. But since none of us were around when medicine was not controlled by government to, from, to some degree, we just think it's normal. And any time the medicine, the system doesn't work the way we think or it should be better, uh, maybe not this audience. I know we're a bunch of libertarians out there. But most people think that, well, we need more government to, 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 to fix it. Where, you know, they can't see the government messed it up in the first place. But anyway, um, um, with, uh, oh, I'm just losing my thought here. Um, with 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 um, with 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 cancer uh, being, well, actually, let, let me let me just rethink. Give me a second here. Um, sorry, BPH. This is what happens when I don't have an audience here. <laughs> sorry about this, guys. Oh, the PSA values. So, the the, the PSA. The cutoff they want is four, and what I was saying is the reason they like things black or white, these labs, is because it's better for managed care. Um, you know, government people, when they see medicine today, it looks like your doctor, they don't look at you. They spend five minutes with you, right? And they just look at a bunch of numbers, and they tell you, oh, this number's high, we need to give you a drug, or, oh, this number is low, or, or what have you. And you as a patient, I'm sure many of you listening think this, you figure, wait a minute. You get paid how much money? All you did was look at a number, or your nurse did, barely, and you just came in, rubber stamped it, and the number was high, and you told me to do something. Well, hell, I can do that. And now that these lab values are put on portals, or you have access to your own labs, more and more people think medicine's pretty easy. All the doctor's doing is looking at a number and checking their code book of protocols. And you know what? In a large, many ways, you're correct. That's what they're doing because the system has dumbed it down. They don't want you, the doctor to spend more time. They want things black or white. So you can do like a flow chart because that, that's how you can make something and manage care. But, and here's the key, medicine, as most of you hopefully know, is not a science. It's a science and an art. I mean, we say the art and science of medicine. And yet the art is what's been stripped away. The communication with patients been stripped away. And it's nothing but science. And a lot of, there's a lot of reasons. I don't want to get into it when we get back to the PSAs here. But yeah, think about it. Medical school, there's, there's 15 applicants for every seat for a conventional medical school. And yes, they purposely limit it. So obviously not a free market. Otherwise, they would have more medical schools open. But anyway, you know, it, with that kind of competition, you need really good grades. And guess what's, what grades they look at? Well, math. Calculus. Calculus for a lot of medical students is a weed out. If you're not good at calculus, then, you, then your GPA is going to suffer. And if your GPA is not perfect 4.0, there's no way you can compete with the 15 other people who all have 4.0s. The thing is, what the hell does calculus have to do with having good bedside matter or dealing with a patient? It doesn't. I mean, the only thing calculus I think you might even run into is if, you're in, if you deal with, with anesthetic medicine. You need to deal with a lot of doses, and, and it's, it's a very... It's uh, kind of a dose-dependent, uh, you know, it's a lot of OCHEM and understanding uh, 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 balances of, 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 of the chemistry. Anyway, the point is, is that you're not using calculus for anything else. You know, a psychiatrist or being a GP, you don't use it. But science is what's ruled the rule-ins and rule-outs for medical students for a long time. So what you're, you're getting are more doctors that focus in the sciences and maybe don't have good communication skills. And then when you get these doctors and you put them in managed care and they have five minutes with you, even if they want to be the artist of medicine, even if they want to speak to a patient and help figure something out, they can't because they're told they have five minutes. You can spend an hour with a patient if you want. You're not getting paid for the time. And you have like, you know, five office staff and you got to pay for all this stuff and your malpractice insurance. Anyway, I'm going to get back here to the PSA, but I, I just really want you to understand why this has occurred in, 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 you know, to this way. All right. So let's get back to PSA. Um, uh, the, the reason I'm, I went into that diatribe is because these lab values are not black or white. They're more, an, they're not digital. I call them analog. 
So instead of black or white, I use the traffic light pattern, green, yellow, red. Okay, green is good. Yellow is eh, ma ma, as we say in Chinese. It's kind of in the middle. And then um, uh, red zone, of course, is a problem. But that's different than the black or white model. But I just wanted to explain why they like black or white. You know, it's to just simplify medicine and you, know, you create your own reality. You know, getting science-focused doctors and then you get you know, the apps and quick visits. Therefore, the only thing left of medicine that they're relying on is the pure science and we've jettisoned the art. Now, if you're looking for something uh, more black or white, uh, many areas of medicine you can treat with just a simple black or white assessment. But prostate cancer, as I just spent the last hour talking about, you see how more complicated this is. It brings up definitions of cancer and about quality of life and what patients want and what your life expectancy is and all these things that you can't boil down into an app. You need to talk to the patient. You need to really have a rapport and understand what their goals are. Not PSA is over four, get a biopsy, help define cancer, rip it out. That is what the system wants to do. So anyway, I, I've belabored that point, but for those of you who knew, I wanted to pull, reiterate it from all these different perspectives so you really grasp why, uh, A, I have a job and what I'm really doing all day, uh, but why men are, find themselves, when, they, when they're in this, this world long enough, they start to see this game. They don't see it at first, but eventually they do. Let's go back to PSA. Here we go. I'm sorry for the other guys who have been waiting this whole time uh, for PSA. So what is it? 4.0 is the cutoff for the feds and the, the system. Unofficially, um, 0 to 2 is the green zone. So if your PSA is 2 or under, that most cases, that's not even a problem. Okay, Even if, it is can if there's cancer there, uh, 2 is <laughs> probably, probably, probably nothing burger. 10 and over? It's considered the red zone, and in most cases, they will say it's cancer automatic. Okay, or let's, let's just say they will fire you as a patient unless you agree to a biopsy if it's over 10 because they have to go with that consideration. Now, I have seen up to, I think, 80 PSA that was not cancer. Grant, the patient was in the hospital, had all these other problems. Um, but most times, though, PSAs, uh, I would say over 20 most likely are cancer. Uh, again, there are some exceptions, but they're extremely rare. Uh, so, yeah, the, the 10 and over, you do start to look at it more seriously. But 2 to 10, that is the yellow zone. And that yellow zone is where most of the patients I see are, are at. And most American men who get diagnosed with a high PSA, they, they're usually not diagnosed with 200 or 400, or I've seen up to 4,000 PSA in my office. So just to put that in context for you guys, okay, 4,000, yes, you heard me right. That would be a meta definite full-blown metastatic prostate cancer all over the body, but that's how you get it that high. But most men who first, you know, they're told there's a problem, the PSA is like four, you know, maybe it's 6.2, you know, maybe it goes to eight, oh my gosh, you know, but that, that, that's what I'm dealing with. And most times that's not a cancer, but that is where the PSA has to be analyzed in the yellow zone. So um, I'm going to start finishing some of this up. I don't want to keep, I can talk all day with prostate, but I want to now give you some other information on where else the PSA could be coming from. I said there are three main areas, prostate cancer, BPH, and prostatitis. Okay. Let me clarify what each of these are. Prostate cancer, most men think they're going to die from. That's wrong. Most men do not die of prostate cancer. And I already covered that in the, earlier in this, in this podcast. The second most men think that BPH means a big prostate. It does not. BPH is a hyperplasia. It does not mean hypertrophy. Okay? Some men think it means benign prostatic hypertrophy. No, it's benign prostatic hyperplasia. And what is hyperplasia? Well, it's like if you have skin tag under your arm. And of, you know, it means that some of the cells are dividing quicker than they normally do. Right? And if it divides quicker, well, you know, um, as I think said earlier in the show, well, you have more cells. If you have more cells, your PSA goes up. But also, the prostate, if the prostate has more cells, there's two ways it can go. Just like a city. If Arizona doubles its population, we knock down some desert and you build the city outward, right? You get city sprawl. You get wide, large, flat deserts slash prostates, right? Um, but you have low density, that's why the light rail line was fought in Arizona and, and many rural areas because, you know, there's not enough people per square mile to make it worthwhile. 
aside from being government and they always lose money anyway. But that's, that, that's why you have low-density cities. Whereas if you're in Manhattan and you're landlocked, okay, you build up, you become a dense city. And the irony is that the smaller BPH glands tend to give you more symptoms because you have a dense prostate pushing in on the urethra, giving you symptoms. And the irony is the people with the largest prostates sometimes don't have any symptoms at all. And this gets confusing and frustrates men when they come in. They say, oh, Dr. Tambor, just stop yapping. Just tell me, what is, what's the normal size prostate and what's my size? You know, normal is, let's say, should be 40 or 50, and his prostate is, is 82. He goes, oh, well, mine's big, so just, you know, just skip to the end, like Ernie would say. Skip to the end, just tell me what I should take to shrink it. That's how guys are. You know, I see a nail, give me a hammer. <laughs> you know, well, no one said you need to shrink the prostate just because it's big. I mean, you know, if you really want to, I can shrink it. You're going to have a hell of a lot of side effects. You know, your testosterone is going to go down the toilet. But, uh, you know, I can shrink it. Whoa, 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 Dr. Tambor. I didn't say I want side effects. I, well, you said you want to shrink it. That's how you shrink it. Whoa, 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 whoa. See, and I say, you know, I tell my patient, you're the one that wants to shrink it. I didn't say that you need to shrink it. You know, what are we treating? Are we, are we trying to shrink a gland because of size or symptoms? So BPH is often more symptom related, depending if it's dense or it gets large. Anyway, you get the idea. But the more cells, the higher the PSA. And the third is prostatitis, where most men mistakenly think it's an infection. That is incorrect. Uh, anytime you hear itis, prostatitis, tonsillitis, pancreatitis, you pick. All of them, itis always, period, end of story, means inflammation. That's what it means. So, um, you know, prostatitis means an inflammation of the prostate. Now, an infection can cause an inflammation. That is true. I gave an example before of having an infection. You know, your PSA spikes up, goes down. Well, you know, th that causes an infection. But that is only 10% of cases. 10% of prostatitis is actually infection. Now, some of you might be saying, wow, I didn't realize that. And some of you also might be a very seniorologist. You might say, you might say, well, Dr. Tambori, all right, so 10%, but my doctor gave me antibiotics. And he said it was a prostatitis and he gave me antibiotics for it. So I must be that 10%. Well, not so fast, Charlie. You see, here's another part. The Rod Serling uh, of, of moment in the twilight zone of prostate cancer or prostate, uh, and that is that even though 10% or less of prostate of PSAs are from, um, uh, are from infection, it turns out that 50 to 60% of these cases, PSAs can be reduced and symptoms can be reduced taking antibiotics. What's that about? <laughs> How is it that if only 10% are infectious and yet 50-60% are helped with antibiotics, well, it shows you we don't have the full story. And I don't want to get all the versions of it. Some people think there is infection that we just can't find. Some, for some people, it's a yeast infection that is being helped a little bit with antibiotics, but you're not treating the underlying cause. Uh, that's a whole other thing about yeast. Uh, any of you that have ongoing problems that no doctor seems to be able to treat, look for yeast because the medical system has stopped really looking for yeast properly. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, so, so, so other things, other things uh, can cause it and, and, and make it worse. Um, so we're talking about, uh, um, you know, um, what was I saying about the, about the yeast, about the PSA? Anyway, I'm losing my, my train of thought with that. It's been a long morning. So anyway, that's with BPH. So, so BPH, you get different kinds. And uh, if it's very big, you can have a higher PSA, but not many symptoms. Uh, if it's dense, I told you it, uh, you can have more symptoms. You just need to figure out which kind. All right. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I jumped off topic. Sorry, guys. I don't have Ernie here to keep me on, on track. It's prostatitis. So the infection. So most times it's not an infection. What I said was that the antibiotics typically uh, can help a prostate even though there's no sign of infection. And that's true. It just it shocks people and, and it confuses them, really. Anyway, those are the three main issues that can throw off your PSA. But here's where it gets even more confusing, is that most men have one two are all three of those conditions all right this is now why you guys understand why i've got a job and why i enjoy my green motorcycle that's the thing which i don't have any toys or that's the only toy i have is my motorcycle that's about it so i don't even get to ride anymore because i've got a daughter <laughs> but 
It's you can have all three. Let's go down the list. If prostate cancer can make the PSA go up and BPH makes it go up because you have a larger prostate and then prostatitis makes it go up and variable. Well, what happens if you have all three? And most of you guys probably do. Let's go down the list. Prostate cancer. Guys tell me we have cancer all the time. So if you have cancer all the time, you probably have prostate cancer somewhere if I biopsy you enough. doesn't mean it's going to do anything to you, but you probably have it. So you got number one. You already have prostate cancer. Number two, BPH. Well, when does your gl- gland start to grow? Well, typically when your hormones get out of balance, when your testosterone starts to go down as you get older and your estrogen levels go up as you gain weight, that's called andropause. Many of you already know because you're probably taking hormones for it or have looked into hormones. But when you have andropause, um, you know, the gland can grow. So usually when you're over 50 years old, most men's prostates begin to increase in size or density, as we talked about. So you already have cancer probably. And if you're older over 50, you probably have some form of BPH that's increasing the PSA. But wait, there's more. Most of you guys have some form of prostatitis, maybe in your background. Let's go over the list of things that could cause prostatitis. And, if, and, and those of you listening this long, I think you'll find this very informative. Because the number one reason that PSAs go up between 2 and 10, basically the PSAs in the yellow zone we talked about, the number one reason that these PSAs are in the yellow zone statistically is prostatitis. Yes, you heard me right. Pro- not cancer prostatitis. The second most common reason PSAs are in the yellow zone is BPH, which means the least likely, rarest reason that your PSA will suddenly be in the yellow zone is prostate cancer. Pretty interesting, huh? Now, you might say, well, that's not what it seemed like for my doctor. My doctor that meant the PSA was, was seven or whatever. He's telling me I need a biopsy. I could have cancer, and he's scaring me to death. Well, yes. Why? Because a doctor cannot be sued for missing prostatitis. You just have an inflamed gland. They can be sued for missing a cancer. And there's another reason why. It's because prostate cancer is pretty easy to legally diagnose. They do a biopsy, they do 12 cores, it's paid for by your insurance, they're protected by their malpractice insurance, and everyone's happy and the hospital's happy because they followed a protocol and you're going down the cattle chute. They like it when it's all organized and simple that way. And if they find cancer, legally you have it, and now they can remove it. If they don't find cancer on the biopsy, even if there's cancer still there, they can't be held liable because they at least did the attempt and followed the protocol. Okay, prostatitis, oh, by the way, and the the biopsy takes like 20 minutes. (laughs) I mean, it doesn't take that much time, and they get reimbursed for it, and they make money doing biopsies. And and I'm not that cynical, guys, to make it seem like it's all about money. I'm I'm really not going to go there, but, you know, they have to pay the bills, and talking to a patient doesn't pay the bills. I mean, they they only will reimburse you for like five, ten-minute consult time. Anything over that is on you as the doctor because you're not being efficient enough the way that they look at it. But prostatitis, which is the number one reason that PSAs go up, is very difficult to determine because it's not as simple as just taking a test. You, you can't just biopsy it and say, oh, it's prostatitis. Heck, as I said, biopsying the prostate will cause prostatitis. So how do you do determine prostatitis? You need to take a history. You need to check the urine. You need to do all sorts of workup on this patient and maybe track their numbers over months or years to determine if it's prostatitis. And it doesn't pay the bills and you have a patient that might have a cancer that could be a liability risk if they don't come back or they don't quite understand what you're doing. So now you understand that although prostatitis is the number one reason that you should look into, the system does not allow doctors the latitude or you to take the time to figure out which one it is before they jump to the biopsy. That is the crux also of this problem. So what can cause prostatitis? Well, it's an inflammation. As I said, it's not an infection most times. Let's go down the list. Okay, first off, what causes it? Well, urinary tract infections. Let's start with that one, okay? Yeast infections, STDs, prior history or an active STD, Um, rectal intercourse, rectal stimulation. And by the way, all this also has to do, especially the infections, with the partner as well. You know, if your wife has yeast infections or gets UTIs and you don't know about when they have them, you can bounce the infection back and forth to each other. And this happens often. 
When women get infections, they get them quick and they get rid of them quick because they just they have a short urethra, obviously. I mean, at least I learned that in medical school. And then they're, they don't have a prostate. But with a man with a long urethra and a prostate, it harbors the bacteria or the yeast. So it's like getting mold in your drywall. It's hard to see, but once it's there, it can just linger for a long time. It's hard to get out. And that is what these infections uh, can, 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 that's where they can come from. So, like I said, those are the infectious sources. But here's all the other, the non-sexual. Here we go. Motorcycles, uh, 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 horse riding, bull riding. And yes, I see a lot of cowboys out here in Arizona. The number one bull in Arizona one year, his name was Dr. Proctor. <laughs> I always love that. Doctor, that kind of sums up why these uh, cowboys all, all see Dr. Tambori. But anyway, um, uh, horse riding, bicycle riding, bikes at the gym, spin class, uh, many of the toys like speedboats, things that just bounce and bang on the water, wave runners, jet skis, snowmobiles, quads. You know, many of you guys do these, these outdoor uh, you know, quad riding, you know, especially all of you guys with your, with your bug out bags and you're your living remotely, uh, which God bless you with your own chicken farms, right? But um, you know, a, a lot of these, these toys can bounce around if you use them often. What else? Um, uh, using heavy machinery, sanding equipment, power equipment, things that vibrate. Um, weightlifting, certain weightlifting, is like, like, like uh, if you do the clean and jerk, all right, if you do that, that type of workout, that could put extra stress on the prostate because you're doing the deep valve salva, tensing your rectal muscles really, really hard to do that, that exercise. I have professional weightlifters I see as patients, and every one of them that does the clean and jerk, they have really bizarre prostates that have been stretched out. Sort of like, like, like you see some of these, these, these African women from certain tribes, and their neck is like a giraffe because they stretch it out with these rings. I see guys who are weightlifters, and their prostate is stretched out like that. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, because of all the tension of that rectal muscle pulling up those weights. Um, also, doing a military press. If you're sitting down doing a military press, that is the worst thing for your prostate. Now, most weightlifting is all good and you know, keeping, ex uh, keeping active. Uh, what else can cause prostatitis or, or inflammation to it? Um, let's go through a few other things. Um, uh, being um, a, a private pilot. Or, or doing a lot of international traveling or flying, okay? Why? Well, if you're a private pilot, you're in an unpressurized plane typically, and the lack of pressure allows, just like your legs can swell, your prostate can swell, and your PSA can artificially go up from a swollen prostate that's, you know, from the pressure. Also, international flying. Now, I went to college in Japan. I know that flight very well. I've been in the Philippines. Um, any of you internationally know, we're talking 25 hours, sometimes you're sitting in a plane. And these planes now don't recline like they used to, and they're not comfortable. And, you know, that's a whole other issue about uh, all the taxes and the TSA, and, you know, the, they have to make cheap seats anymore. But when you're sitting up and down without reclining, because now people behind you, all the snowflakes flip out because you reclined your seat. You offended me. Oh, you're in my safe space. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. But you can't ever recline anymore. So you're, all of that weight is sitting over that prostate for hours and you can't move. Matter of fact, I mentioned motorcycles, which is a reason that you can have a high PSA or throw off the prostate, cause some prostatitis. What, I, this is a good point to, to inject this. It's not because motorcycles vibrate you know, the old, you know, the small little motorcycles when you grew up on dirt bikes, yeah, that could happen. But motorcycles today have suspensions that are better than most automobiles. So when I ride my, my, my little cupcake, you know, she doesn't vibrate. It's not like it's, it doesn't, doesn't bounce up and down. It's a really smooth ride. So why are motorcycles a problem? It's because you are stuck sitting up and down like in, that air, like, like in the airplane for hours and hours because riding a motorcycle is a hell of a lot of fun. So time flies. You don't realize how, how long you're on it. But you're sitting, you're up and down. Why? Because if you lean back like you can in your car to stretch out on a long, on, on a long drive, if you try to lean back uh, in, in a motorcycle, you're dead. You have to keep your core up and down. So what I'm getting to is you put all that weight over the, over the prostate, and the prostate cannot breathe, and it starts to get inflamed. And, and, uh, um, and that, I, 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 even if you don't have a motorcycle, guys, I'm giving you examples of ways to think about what could affect the prostate. Long sitting or pressure on the prostate where it can't breathe.
you know. And of course, you add banging to it, like a horse or or, or vibrating equipment or what have you. It adds to it adds another level. Then, if it happens to be rubbed in some way, you know, prostate massage or rectal intercourse or what have you, then that can be a problem. Um, you know, and then uh, um, uh, and anyway, and then if it gets infected on top of it, you know, you have a trifecta. All of these reasons can um, can make your PSA go up. Okay, so oh wow, the screen just went off here for some reason. Uh, I guess Ernie's got to look at that one. All right, so I'm going to wind this down. Uh, I think uh, some of you guys may have tuned out already if this seemed a little bit long and a little too involved. But for those of you still listening, I'm guessing it's because you have an interest in this. Your PSA may, it may be up or a loved one or your, someone around you uh, is being told they might have a problem. Hopefully, I gave you enough information to realize that there's much more involved here. It's not simply black or white PSA over four. Now, on the flip side, you know, if the PSA is 30 or 50 or 100, I don't want a patient to go, oh, well, I heard the PSAs aren't reliable. It's probably not cancer. I'm going to go see the acupuncturist for this. Well, no. If your PSA is 40 or 50 or something, that, that's a serious case. That's metastatic cancer most likely, um, and, and you need to be worked up from that realm. But if you're in the 2 to 10 range and a doctor has not really spoken with you or, or, or asked anything about you or done a workup in any way, they want to go right to biopsy, I would find another doctor, in my opinion, okay? And there's plenty of other doctors that are younger doctors that understand this realm of active surveillance. All right, so I'm going to think for a moment here if there's anything else I wanted to add. Uh, you see that screen just went out. It's okay. It does that because it's Windows. Oh, it's Windows? Yeah. Just remind me later. Okay, remind me later. Oh, there we go. So here we go. Matter of fact, just as it went out, this is what I wanted to show you guys. So if you happen to be watching the video, um, I had the, these prostate diagrams up this whole time. I just, I just want to show you uh, over here a diagram of, if you can see the arrow, um, my little hand here, it's on the right with that big picture of the side view of the prostate, uh, the, the penis and the bladder. So I just want to show you what, the, what this does. I'm going to explain to you what the prostate even does. Some of you don't even know. So the bladder is up here, and then the bladder, the urine goes down and it wants to go out through the urethra, through the penis, as you can see. And what this, this structure here is, is the prostate. Uh, this area up here looks like some fecal matter, but that's actually your seminal vesicles. The seminal vesicles uh, sit on top of the prostate and inject the sperm and the semen into the prostate through this little duct. So when the prostate squeezes during an orgasm, then the semen goes two directions. It's like squeezing a balloon. If you squeeze a balloon right here, half the semen goes out the, pro out the penis, but the other half of the semen goes up and then hits the backboard, which is the, your, your sphincter of the prostate, should be closed, and then falls back into the prostate for round two. And then you have another reflex orgasm. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming there's no kids listening this, this long into this boring topic, but you guys know what I'm talking about. So, so there's a second reflex orgasm usually. That's why there's a few spasms during one orgasm. And it's because your body is, does not want to waste the precious fluid of sperm that, you know, it's spending all of its resources trying to uh, tran transmit, right? So uh, each time you have the amount of semen that's there and you get more and more, a little bit more out. Okay, so if your sphincter up here does not work, if the sphincter connecting the bladder to the prostate of, uh, is, is, is open, either because BPH has distended it, or you've had prostate surgery because of BPH, or something that's keeping this valve open, not only will you have urine you know, kind of squirt out on occasion and have a form of incontinence, but the opposite happens. During an orgasm, the semen shoots upward, does not get stopped by that sphincter, and goes into your bladder. And so that's why men often have what's called a dry orgasm. So they feel the orgasm, but all the semen is up in the bladder in the urine. And you can tell by um, just looking at the urinalysis. You can look for, you'll see dead sperm all, all in the urine. So, all right, so what does the prostate ultimately do? Well, it has a few functions. Maybe I should have started with this in the beginning, but uh, uh, I know some of you guys just wanted to get the PSA and what all this is about. But what the prostate does is it acts first as a sphincter of the bladder. So therefore, during sex, you don't want urine coming out, you know, when someone has intercourse, clearly. So the, the, the prostate needs to recognize sexual stimulation and close down the sphincter so urine doesn't come out. That's number one. 
The second thing that it does is I said it injects the semen, so I explained that, that whole dynamic. But there's one other thing. The prostate is technically a gland, okay? And a gland always means it means some kind, it secretes some kind of glandular fluid. Your salivary glands make saliva. Mammary glands make milk. Well, your prostate gland makes prostatic fluid. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute, I thought you just talked about seminal fluid from the seminal vesicle. You're correct. And uh, the, the, the ejaculate has three components. Well, it's got a few, but it's got three main components. First is the, the train. Uh, I was the train. I was thinking of a train going and picking up passengers from each uh, train stop. That's kind of what happens here. You've, you have your testicles down here. Well, you guys all know where your testicles are. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just getting tired, guys. I'm going to try turn this off in a minute. Uh, I really hope you guys are learning some things. But here's, the testicles are here that makes the sperm. It makes sperm based off of your testosterone. When you make testosterone in your brain, technically it's uh, you know, towards the hypothalamus and then uh, you know, the pituitary hypothalamus. And then um, it makes what's called LH and FSH, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Those hormones drop from your brain into your testicles. Then your testicles take those hormones and then make testosterone from it. And, and uh, also, it helps mature the sperm. So the sperm from your testicles, then, you know, they mature in there. And then when they're ready and they're mature enough, well, then they will go up what's called the vas deferens. They go through the inguinal canal, which is when your doctor says turn and cough. That's the inguinal canal. And it, the sperm goes through that tube and then connects to the seminal vesicle. And the seminal vesicle is the storage house for the sperm. So the sperm all resides in that seminal vesicle. It just hangs out. And it gets fed by the seminal fluid. So the sperm comes from the testicle, and the seminal vesicle stores it and feeds it. It's like a halfway house. <laughs> the seminal vesicle is a halfway house, or I leave it there. And it just waits until you're ready to have an orgasm. But wait, there's one last step in the stop here. What does the prostate fluid do then? The prostate fluid is the countermeasures against the evil process of the woman. <laughs> Obviously in jest here, but, you know, the, 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 there's countermeasures. And Mother Nature is beautiful how she's figured this out. You see, prostatic fluid is extremely alkaline. Extremely alkaline. Why? Well, I mean, how do you know? Well, you know, not to be too uh, risque with any of this stuff, or, uh, but, uh, you know, if, uh, if, if semen gets on uh, an open wound or if semen gets in someone's eye, you know, it can burn it, right? It gets red really bad. Well, why? It's because it's extremely alkaline. It's the equivalent of being acid, just on the other direction. Well, why is it so alkaline? And, and by the way, the reason, the reason we get cancer down there is because it's so alkaline. How many of you guys have heard, or women too, listening? Why is it that we hear about when cancer, what's the first thing you want to do is not be acidic, right? The more acidic your body, the more unhealthy your body, the more acidic you become. You know, alcohol, stress, all these things make your red meat, make your body acidic. Well, why is that bad? It's because the more acidic you are, the more it compromises your immune system. Your immune system doesn't work well in an, in an acidic environment. It works better in, a, in, a, in like a, a, a moderate pH around seven and slightly alkaline actually. So, so it needs to, it, anyway, so, so, so being acidic is bad because it can facilitate cancer. Well, being the opposite, very alkaline also can facilitate cancer because anytime your pH is out of neutral, you're potentiating it by a logarithmic power of 10 to a degree of concentration that, you know, can facilitate cancer. Because, you know, think about it, acid or alkaline, both can irritate your skin, okay? And it causes irritation. What do you think smoking does? You know, uh, uh, speaking of Rush Limbaugh again, smoking, the carcinogens don't just cause cancer by themselves. They're really irritating the lining of your, of your, of your lungs. And anytime you irritate anything enough times, eventually it says enough is enough. It flips what's called an oncogene and can become cancerous. So the more you irritate something, the more your body is in an unnatural state, uh, the higher the risk that you can eventually create a cancer from it. And being overly acidic is the most common reason we think, but also being alkaline. So you don't really have any part of your body that's that alkaline, but in men, 
It's the prostate. That's all. All it is, is is this whole ball of alkalinity. And that is why prostate cancer is such a problem in that gland. Now, I, I hinted earlier, well, why is it alkaline? Why would Mother Nature give you this highly alkaline deal that's going to just cause you nothing but problems and can burn people's eyes or whatever else, right? Why? Well, it's because women are acidic. Why? Well, because they have an open vagina. And, uh, you know, bacteria, yeast, all sorts of things can get in there. And obviously women are always battling that and they have to take better care uh, to be with, with sexual hygiene and, and, and being clean so they don't have an infection, right? We all know about that. Well, again, bacteria and such, they, 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 although they like to make your body more acidic, um, to, 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 uh, your immune system is down. But if it's, if it's too acidic, they can't live there. And the vaginal area is very acidic. And it's on purpose to, you know, kill everything. Well, it also will kill sperm. So, therefore, the beauty and the symmetry of nature is that the the vaginal area is acidic and the semen gets injected into a fluid of equal but opposite pH of alkalinity. And so, therefore, the the alkaline uh, part of the seminal fluid neutralizes and it turns all liquid. And then you have like a pH of 7, which is nice and safe. And at that point, hopefully enough of the sperm of, makes it up into the fallopian tubes. And, and you've got, uh, you got a little baby coming, right? So that, that's pretty much how the system works. So I wanted to explain what it does, why it's there, um, and why if you remove the prostate, you run into some of these issues, such as, well, right off the bat, you can't have kids anymore. I mean, I mean that's an obvious one. Usually older guys are not too concerned about it, unless I guess you're a George Lucas or Al Pacino, they're all having kids at age 70, that kind of thing. But that aside, um, it also does the sphincter. So you will, without a prostate or a properly working, a working prostate, you'll have um, you know, uh, urination difficulties, as we talked about, hesitancy, urgency, this sort of thing. Um, and so uh, anyway, I think I'll leave that part there. Uh, as far as the diagram, just a couple last things for any of you still listening right now. Um, the, uh, the prostate... Oh here, oh, here we go on the screen. Uh, so if, if you look over here, uh, where, where, my, uh, where the arrow is, it's in the rectum. And you see that the rectum, the, the bottom of your colon, is right next to the prostate, right here. So that is why when the doctor inserts his finger, he's trying to palpate the back part of the prostate. So he is trying to feel it. But what you also hopefully are figuring out very quickly is that the doctor's finger and you can see my arrow moving around here a bit, can only palpate maybe 30% of the prostate and only the back end of the prostate. The, this top part and up here by the bladder and this whole part of the anterior part of the prostate, all of this area you cannot feel with a digital rectal exam. So if a doctor feels your prostate and the first thing he says, well, doctor, you feel something? Well, whether he does or not, he may not always tell you the truth anyway, but... If he doesn't feel something, it doesn't mean you can't, you know, maybe you don't have a cancer. Now, the good news is that most prostate cancer occurs at the back, the posterior gland. So like 80, 90% of cancer does show up back here. Um, and the low aggression cancer tends to show up here. But the anterior of the gland, you can get more serious cancer and it's harder to find. And, and uh, so that's why it's important um, to be aware there's more to that than just the DRE. Uh, that's why PSA testing properly with all the caveats I gave you, PSA velocity, pers uh, PSA density, PSA pattern, all of that helps you determine if a cancer might be there, even if you can't feel it. And then last but not least is imaging. So let me just touch on imaging a little bit. Uh, ultimately, there is an article I'm going to recommend for you guys. Um, oh, actually, I'm not sure if you saw what I was pointing at because uh, there's different arrows in computers. So for those of you that couldn't see, if you didn't see the arrow move, um, it's this area here. So your, your fingers here in the rectum, there's the back of the prostate there. That's where you can feel 20, 30%, and the rest of this prostate you can't. Okay, you may not have seen that earlier. All right, so imaging. So now comes the question, well, why don't I just get imaging? Why do I need a biopsy if this whole concern about spreading a cancer and all of this? Why don't I just get an image? Makes sense. We've got all these new toys now, you know, ultrasounds and CT scans and MRIs, and they got real fancy ones now, three Tesla coil, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it was a three Tesla MRI, and, you know, with different different uh, agents with, with gadolidium dyes, and they have some newer ones. So all this imaging's out. 
why don't you just do an image? I mean, heck, I do imaging in my office. I mean, that's how, that's where m most patients find me is they want imaging of the prostate. And yes, imaging is very, very important in many ways. But the irony is, is that an imaging does not necessarily identify a cancer the way a patient thinks it does. Okay. When you do a, uh, when you, when, you know, a patient thinks that we just do a rectal probe, take some pictures of the prostate, and then if they say, Doc, did you see something? You know, just, just, you know, skip to the end, skip to the end. Just tell me, you know, did you see something or not? You know, what they expect is that there's this, you know, there's like this purple neon flashing, like Ernie says, you know, a you know, little arrow saying, here's the cancer right here. Well, let's do a thought experiment. Let's say that that's what you can see with an imaging easily. Patient says, just tell me, do I see, do you see cancer? That's all I want to know. Okay, fine. You know, do the image. And there's a big purple arrow saying, here's the cancer right here on the left side of the gland. Are we done? You got your answer. You want to know if there's cancer? Yeah, there is. Have a nice day. You know? Well, that doesn't really answer your question, right? Because the first next thing out of your mouth is, oh, my God, I didn't think I'd can't. Well, well, is it bad? Is it aggressive? Is it this? Is it that? What should I do? But oh, well, all this stuff comes out. Well, you know, but yet guys think it's just about locating a cancer. Well, what I'm getting to is that just identifying a cancer doesn't really move the needle. You know, patients think it will, but it really doesn't. So because of that, that's why imaging has not been to uh, uh, accept it amongst urologists for the last 20 something years. Now I do it all the time. That's, that's what, again, that's what I focus on my practice, but they didn't because of that reason. So now though, imaging costs have come down and more and more men, uh, the baby boomer generation is in that age where you do want prostate uh, cancer. There's a risk for prostate cancer. And more and more men with the internet are saying, I don't want a biopsy for a whole host of reasons. So they now are coming to doctors with cash in hand, or maybe Bitcoin in hand, and saying, look, doc, I want an image. I don't want a biopsy. I read stuff online. Image or bust. So these doctors are being forced to do imaging because the patients are forcing them and the hospital administrators who are all bankrupt, you know, looking over bankrupt uh, uh, hospitals, that is, are sitting back saying, wait a minute, you've got all these older men who have disposable income who are coming in with cash in hand saying, Doc, just, you know, I want you to use your MRI on me and just tell me if you see something. They're saying, Mr. Urologist, Mr. Employee, <laughs> take their damn money, take a picture and show them something, you know, who cares if they can do anything with it? And that's what's happening. Many of these doctors now, many of these uh, what patient groups, they're all pushing for imaging, but they're getting imaging done by doctors that are reluctant to do it and don't understand how to use the imaging results. Because it's not about just seeing something. And I'm going to go one step further. So now you go, you, you get the MRI done, okay? You convince your doctor, I want to do an MRI, I don't want to do a biopsy, and you come back a week or two later, and you're, 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 you're concerned, but you also feel a little, a little proud because you, out, you outsmarted the doctor. He wanted to do a biopsy, and you said, I'm not going to do a biopsy. I, I used my internet savvy and found about imaging, and I convinced you to, to do it for me, and now I want to come in and get my results biopsy-free. And this is what happens, guys. This is... This is Straight out, of, straight out of Compton as far as what I see every day in my office. So the patient goes to the urologist. Doc, we did the scan. I'm back two weeks later. My, nerf, my, my wife and I are nervous. What did you find? Did you see something? That's what I was here. Did you see something? And the doc says, yes. Unfortunately, we found a hypochoic lesion in the posterior left apex. And the patient goes, in English, Doc, what does that mean? He says, well, there's a black spot on the left. Don't look good. Oh, the patient says. So does that mean it could be cancer? I mean, that doesn't sound good. You look, you look a little nervous there, Doc. So is it cancer? And the doctor says, yeah, it could be. Ah, Doc, you said could. That means it doesn't have to be. Well, I like the sound of that. Well, what else could it be? Well, it could be inflammation. You know, it could be cancer. It could be inflammation. And it's true. If you see a black area, it could be inflammation or it could be cancer. Matter of fact, cancer is inflammatory, so they go hand in hand. But anyway, patient says, wow, well, I like the sound of that. Inflammation doesn't sound like cancer. And uh, yeah, yeah. So, all right, doc, how do I determine if it's inflammation and not cancer? That's what I really want to know now. And the doctor says, ah, and he sits back slowly with a Cheshire cat grin. And he looks at you with that little wily look. And he says, I'm glad you asked. We need to do a biopsy.
Ta-da! Drop the mic. That is what goes on out there. Okay, that is what's happening to a lot of you men, is that they're, 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 you're rushing into these imaging centers that are all the Johnny-come-lately places. These are doctors that don't really want to do the imaging because it does not legally diagnose a cancer. Only a biopsy can legally diagnose it, as I said earlier, and only a biopsy can legally give you an aggressive aggression score, which is not always what you think aggression is anyway. It's, it's, remember, it's a technical thing for them. Um, and so they don't really want to do a, a imaging, but you get the imaging done, and then everyone sits around and looks at something some, you know, black area, and then it's back to, do I biopsy it or not? So that's why having imaging done at the local MRI centers, it's not something I recommend unless the doctor performing it only specializes in prostates and has written articles on this topic and understands the dynamic here, okay? But if you're just going to, you know, up the street and they say, well, you know, why do you need to fly to Arizona or go here or go there to get an MRI or an ultrasound? You know, we have it up the street. We, we do prostates all the time. Don't worry about it. We got this covered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to find your, yourself right into that dilemma I just outlined. Trust me on that one. Okay, so now your question is going to be, well, all right, Doc, well, well, you know, so what do you do different? I mean, I mean, I mean if, if that's not how you use it, well, then how you use imaging? Well, here's the thing. Imaging um, is very helpful, and if there is a high suspect area, then, yeah, it could be cancer. And I'm trying to figure out the chance that a cancer is there in the first place based off of a high PSA. If there's no real evidence of cancer through other testing or through imaging, well then, you know, I focus on maybe uh, prostatitis and try to get the PSA down naturally or through medications so we can avoid the biopsy. Remember, I'm not against biopsies, I'm against unnecessary uh, uh, biopsies, you know, done for the wrong reasons. So anyway, um, the, uh, let's say with the biopsy. Boy, I'm going to end this show here. I'm almost, <laughs> my brain's going off. Oh, with, 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 the, with the image. So why are we doing the image? So, so, the, so the image, if I see a black area, let's say on the left, wherever it is, it tells me a few things. First off, if it's a cancer, it lets me know maybe the pot potential aggression. As I said earlier, if it's the, depending where it is, it increases the risk of it being more aggressive or lower aggression. But that's another topic. What else? Well, if I see an area, it could, be it, it could be inflamed, maybe it's not cancer. Well, I need to feel the prostate. If I feel the prostate at the same time I'm doing the image, then when I see a black area, I can tell more likely if it's cancer or not. How? Because cancer usually palpates hard. Prostatitis or inflammation areas palpate soft. We actually use the word boggy often. So if I see a black spot and that's all I see and I just, I'm just some MRI tech that gave, a, gave the scan to your doctor and nobody's really is looking at your case, they just say it's a black spot and let's biopsy it. But if I just felt it and it felt hard and I see a black spot in the same location, that's probably more cancer, all right? And uh, obviously inflammation the other direction. Now let's go one step further. What else can imaging tell a doctor who knows how to utilize it? Well, the location of the cancer. Now, now, an hour ago, I talked about location. Uh, I'm sorry, I talked about that cancer cannot kill you unless it gets out of the prostate, right? If it stays in the prostate, you know, it, unless it blocks your, your urine, uh, it's not going to do anything to you, really. Now, if it gets out, that's the problem. So, therefore, and of course, you know, as I said, you start the 10-year clock and even longer, and, and there's all that, that long discussion I had. Well, guys want to know, okay, what's the chance the cancer's out? Well... One of the ways to determine if it's out is where is the cancer with regard to the edge of the gland? Location, location, location. If the cancer is in the middle of the prostate, irregardless whether or not it's aggressive or not, if it's in the middle of the prostate, then it will take years for it to get to the edge of the prostate to escape it. If the prostate cancer is at the edge of the prostate, at the edge, but not pushing beyond it, that would be the yellow zone. So if it's in the middle of the prostate, we'll call that a green, the green zone uh, risk cancer location. At the edge, yellow zone. And if it's bulging out from the capsule, that, you know, bulging outward, that would be a T3 cancer, or what we call, it, we'll call it the red zone. Well, which one do you think is high risk it's going to get out? The one that's bulging out, right? If it's bulging out, it's really, it's pushing its way out. 
So that's why, again, it comes down to is having cancer really the problem or is it having a cancer that's trying to kill you the problem? And most guys, ultimately, it's, you know, they're willing to live with a the cancer. They just don't want the kind that's going to kill them. And the only way it will is if it gets out. So that is why we use imaging and other testing like the rate of PSA increase and all these things we've been chatting about today to help figure out the ch not just the chance that cancer is there, but the chance that such a cancer is, is producing PSA or worsening versus PSA from something else like BPH or prostatitis. And then also, if it is worsening, then what's the chance that that cancer could ultimately escape? And that is a function of how bad the PSA is with, with, relative, uh, with, with, with relation to the volume of your gland. Remember, having a high PSA may not tell you the whole story. If it's high with a large prostate, it's not, lar it's not bad. If you have a high PSA and you have a small prostate, then that PSA is a problem. Okay, And so if your density calculation is very bad and red zoned, that's a risk that the cancer can get out. And then if the imaging shows a cancer not in the middle, but sticking out at the edge, that is a red zone risk that this cancer might get out. And there's actually one other, what I call a canary in the coal mine, uh, when guys really just want to know, not do I have cancer, and not if it, is it worsening or not, but when is, when is the point of no return? When should I pull the ripcord? And what indicators do, do we use to determine, again, not do I have cancer, but the chance it's going to get out soon? I call them the three canaries. And you guys now are experts. You just learned two of them, the PSA density and the, the T status, which is where the cancer is located. There's one last test, and I'm going to start winding this down now. Uh, the last canary is called the PAP, P-A-P. And yes, I am, well, I should say, no, I'm not talking about you ladies, Pap, okay? So if it's you guys are cringing, oh, my God, I have to get a Pap? How does that happen? No, no, a Pap, it's a blood test, and it's called the prostatic acid phosphatase. And this test is, is believe it or not, the precursor to the PSA. It's what the PSA replaced back in the, back in the 80s. The Pap... Is an oldie but goodie. It's still around. I still run it, despite being an old test, because it was used back in the day to find out what type of prostate, I'm sorry, what type of cancer was killing a patient. In other words, after the cancer is already metastatic, you know, like, like, like Rush Limbaugh again. Rush Limbaugh has, has shortness of breath. They do some imaging. They find out that there's black spots in his lung. It's cancer. Well, the, one of the, of course, you're going to say, well, what treatment? You know, okay, well, he's got lung cancer. Well, what's the treatment? Well, believe it or not, guys, the treatments for, the, the treatments for cancer are often uh, augmented or dictated by where the cancer comes from. Now, Rush Limbaugh's cancer most likely is lung cancer, lung cancer, right? It's probably lung cells that got irritated from cigar smoking that eventually flipped an oncogene and became a cancer. That's probably most likely what happened with him. But keep in mind, it, that's not necessarily the case. He could have had, you know, pancreatic cancer, and then that cancer spread to the lung. So what he really has is pancreatic cells in the lung, which is the example I gave before about having, you know, a piece of uh, cancer of your prostate growing on your eyeball or something, if you remember that discussion. So, so, so cancers can move and they can spread to other areas. Why is that important? It's because these cancers have different metabolisms. They do different things. So you would treat a, a breast cancer differently than a prostate cancer or different than lung cancer. I'll just give you one example of prostate and breast cancer are hormone linked, right? That's why people talk about testosterone that might ruin, you know, testosterone can make a prostate cancer worse. That's, you know, it's, it's debated, I know, but uh, that's, that's the thinking. Matter of fact, if you have bad prostate cancer that's metastatic and you have a PSA of 1,000, guess what they do? They, give, they, they perform a double orchidectomy, which is, uh, or bilateral orchidectomy, which is basically they remove your testicles. Why? Because your testicles make testosterone, and testosterone irritates the prostate cancer. So you can have a PSA of 1,000, and when you remove your testicles, the PSA drops down to sometimes one or less like automatically that shows you the power of what testosterone can do now again this is a loaded topic and and it doesn't mean that all testosterone is going to infuriate a cancer and i don't want to go further into that but but hormones do play into this um just finishing my point here on the, on the hormones uh what's what i was saying breast can't uh, testosterone um 
Oh boy, oh boy. Oh, what was I? Oh, with the. I know, guys. You can see how tired I am here. Oh, uh, with the the imaging. Uh, tree, what the heck was I talking about here? Oh, the 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 pap. That's what I was talking about. So so what you have is the is the hormones can throw off can throw off the cancer. And hold on, let me just write this down so I don't forget that. Because I'm I'm winding this down. I'm I'm almost done prostate. I feel like I'm at work now. Um, so hormones can can irritate uh, these cancers. So you have to you know you 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 want to look you want to look at these hormones. Um, but um, the pap is is a test to let you know what type of cancer you have. So like I said, if you have a breast cancer or a pancre- or, or prostate cancer, you can treat it by removing your hormones. Now Rush Limbaugh having a lung cancer, assuming it's primarily from the lung, well, removing his testicles is not going to shrink his lung cancer because lung cancer is not affected by testosterone. So that just gives you one example of how cancers have different abilities and, and temperaments and, and can react differently than medications and, and such. So you want to know what type you have. Anyway, I'm kind of getting in the weeds a little too much with this, but the PAP test, prostatic acid phosphatase, was done when someone was diagnosed with cancer, but they didn't know back in the day where the cancer originated from. So therefore, they could figure out what treatments to do. So that's what the PAP is. Well, you might say, okay, what's, why do they use it now? Well, um, the, the PAP ultimately was replaced by the PSA because, because doctors and patients ultimately wanted a test that didn't tell you, that did not tell you if you had cancer after it got out. People wanted to have a test that told you if you had cancer before it got out, right? I mean, that seems obvious. Well, that's where the PSA came from. The problem is, is that the PSA is highly unreliable, and we discussed that like the first hour about you know, issues with the PSA and how everything can make it go up and you know, motorcycles and all sorts of things. So the PSA is not always reliable. Um, so, um, so why do they still have the PAP today? They still have it because if your PSA is, let's say, over 10, over 20, and you want surgery, there is a chance that that cancer is already out now. There's a chance it's out. And if it's almost, if it's out, then a doctor cannot remove your prostate if it's already out. Why? Because that's considered insurance fraud. If they remove your prostate, that costs like $30,000 or more to remove it. Well, the insurance company doesn't want the doctor calling them up again for more money. But if they remove your prostate and charge for that, when they already know the cancer is out, well, guess what? Now they're going to have to go back and, and now treat you for metastatic prostate cancer, which is radiation and hormones, a whole bunch of other stuff. That's another $100,000. So if the doctor knowingly removed your prostate when there was evidence that it could have been out already, that is double dipping the insurance company and insurance fraud. And many urologists got in trouble for that, actually. So doctors now have to show due diligence that the cancer is still contained before they go forward. And one of the ways that they determine this is they pulled back out of mothballs the PAP test. So you can now understand why. A test that tells you if the cancer is out is a good test to show if the canary, you know, the canary in the coal mine. So that test is the third canary. There's the PSA density, the T status location of the cancer, and the PAP. And that PAP test, you could get done, order it through your local doctor. You might have to look it up. It's not a common test, but they can order it. It takes about two weeks to come back. And if any of those numbers are bad, guys, if your PSA density is too high, if, the, if some imaging shows a cancer or suspect cancer bulging out, and or if your PAP score is abnormal, if any of those are abnormal, I would look at that as a much, much more serious situation that a cancer might not only be there, but a cancer might be getting ready to run for the exits, which still, like I said, does not mean you're dead tomorrow. I mean, it's like I said, five years until you even know there's a problem if it even gets out. And then another five years beyond that uh, of, of, of more serious treatments. And then you're still having quality of life for the most part. And that doesn't take into account all the new medications and things like Zyfigo and Zytiga and uh, hormone ablation treatment and natural treatments. And the fact that you're probably going to die of something else anyway. All right. 
I think I'm done. I could go on forever, as you guys can probably imagine, uh, about this topic. But um, those of you that those of you that are still listening, hopefully you've learned, um, well, for nothing else, what I do for a living. You've heard me probably for years are you know, arguing with Ernie with you know Trump and all the rest of this. But um, you know, this is what I do all day, and I've created this practice uh, through the last almost 20 years now, I guess. Um, I uh, worked with Mayo surgeons in urology or Mayo trained doctors um, in urology. I'm trained as a naturopath myself. I'm not an MD, although, you know, uh, I'm honored that most MDs put me in their own camp. They kind of consider me one of them. Not that I'm trying to be, mind you. I'm proud of being a naturopath, trust me. But the fact that we can, that we can speak the same language. I act as a broker, actually, like a translator. You know, uh, kind of like how, how libertarians sometimes we tend to be in between the conservatives and liberals. You know, we agree with freedom of social issues with liberals, but freedom of economics from, with conservatives. We kind of act as sometimes a, a broker, perhaps. Well, the same thing here. You know, I act, I'm, I'm tr I act as a broker between the conventional surgeon and the alternative doctor. The person saying biopsy, PSA, surgery, and the alternative person saying they're all evil, don't feed the beast, and uh, take a bunch of herbs uh, that you may not be able to afford over the next 30 years of your life. So how do you manage all this? How do you know what your problem is? What are you treating? Are you treating a cancer? But we have it all the time. Or are you treating a high PSA? That's a completely different issue. Or maybe your question is, why do I have symptoms of urination? That's a different question, especially if you have a high PSA. You know, maybe your, maybe your problem is, yeah, I assume I have prostate cancer because my biopsy said so, but I just want to know, do I have the kind that's going to kill me or not? You know, because if it's not going to kill me, I don't want to be spending all this time and money, well, A, worrying about it, and I don't want to spend, you know, $1,000 a month on supplements and IVs and, and, you know, for a long time. And that's the other part. When do you stop it? You know, if you think that a cancer is going to kill you in two years, you, you kind of will throw everything at it. And you say, okay, I got two years to battle this. But what if someone says you have cancer, but... There's only like a, you know, one out of 11, uh, one out of 40 chance you're going to die from it. And if you die from it, it could be 20 years from now or 10, 15 years from now. I mean, it's easy to say, stop talking, doctors, tell me what to take. Put me on IVs. I want to take this herb and this online. I read about this, blah, 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 blah. Guys just want to jump into it, but they don't often stop to think, how long are you going to do this for? When do you stop? And the patient says, well, what do you mean, Dr. Taylor? What do you mean, when do I stop? I stop when the cancer has gone. Ah... Ah, there's the question, isn't it? When do you stop? Oh, when the cancer's gone. Here's the question. When is the cancer gone? The answer is it will never be gone. Yeah, you heard me right. Prostate can If you have prostate cancer, I don't care what you do, you will never be free of the prostate cancer. Ever, 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 unless you have your prostate removed. Now, some of you are about to turn this off and go, what the heck, whiplash? What, what? I thought you were a naturopath. You don't believe in it, blah, 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 blah. Wait, wait, calm down, relax. No, no. What I mean is, is that the only way a cancer can be legally diagnosed is on a biopsy, which means that the only way to tell you that the cancer is gone is repeating the biopsy. But the thing is, if they re-biopsy you and they don't find the cancer the second time, do you think a urologist worried about being sued is going to say, oh, guess what? Oh, yeah, congratulations. You know, I can't wait to read about what herbs you took because I'm going to put you on the front page of Medscape and you're a medical wonder. You cured yourself of, of prostate cancer and the nurses are having a ticker tape parade like some fantasy. No, that's not going to happen. The doctor, the urologist says, sorry, I think we missed it. Let's biopsy you again in six months or a year. Because once they find it the first time, as far as they're concerned, at least for liability standards, you will always have that cancer as long as that prostate remains. The only way a doctor will tell you you're prostate cancer-free is when you remove the prostate. And then assuming your PSA remains low. Undetectable, actually. Should be. Okay? That's it. Now, a patient says, wait, 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 you tell me you don't believe in natural treatments, blah, blah, blah. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that by what metric are you, can you say the cancer is gone? You know, when the PSA goes under four, does that mean it's gone? Probably not. I mean, most guys see me because they don't trust the PSA in the first place. If the PSA is over four, you know, most of you guys probably listening right now already know. If it's over four, it doesn't mean that you have prostate cancer. 
You know, I went and rattled a whole list of reasons your PSA can be high. And if the PSA is under four, here's the real kicker, it doesn't mean you don't have prostate cancer. And if any of you have had carcinogen exposures, radiation from Chernobyl, yeah, I've had a patient from Poland, from Chernobyl, and a young person had a whack out uh, prostate cancer. That was a Chernobyl-induced. Uh, if you've had Agent Orange, if you're in the military, you know, from Nam, if you've been around agriculture, 2,4-D, DDT, if you played in the mosquito trucks in Texas, you know, back in the day when kids would run around and chase the trucks and play in the fog, that was like 2,4-D. Or no, I'm sorry, it was DDT you guys are playing in. Full carcinogen, and it, can, it stays in your fat cells, it stays in your neurons of your brain for the rest of your life. And that can certainly disrupt and cause a cancer. So anyway, what I'm getting is these carcinogen cancers often don't put out PSA. The worst cancer I've seen in my profession, my, my professional life was a man who had all 12 out of 12 cores, 90 plus percent of every core Gleason 10 cancer. And for any of you that really know prostate stuff, you know what I just said there. That was, that's like the antichrist cancer. And yet, and, and how does guy get it? He was a lifer in the military. He was in Nam. He was in Korea. Um, he had uh, Agent Orange. I think he was even the Bikini Island experiments as well, if I, if I recall. He was, like, he was like George C. Scott playing Patton in my office. That's who this guy was. Anyway, his PSA, here's the kicker. His PSA never went over 1.8. Never went over 1.8. And yet he had the prostate cancer from hell. How is that possible? Well, like I said, there's over a thousand different types of prostate cancer. They all have different personalities. And some of them, the personality is they do not manufacture PSA. They are invisible. It's like a cloaked ship. It's like the Klingon or Romulan bird of prey. You know, Kirk goes, what's that fuzzy star wiggling to the left there, Mr. Chekhov? You know, it's that, it's, 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 it's cloaked. And some of these cancers you can't see. And even imaging may not always pick it up. So anyway, there's all different types of cancers out there and, and, and issues. But that's what I'm saying is what is the goal of treatment? You, you say, well, I just, you know, tell me what to do and have this go away. Well, if you want the cancer gone, I'll tell you what the answer is. Very simple. Is you remove the prostate. You, know, you get a biopsy if you're worried about cancer. And you keep biopsying it until they find a cancer cell. And then they're going to tell you to remove it. You remove it. Then you can go back and play golf. So if any people out there, they're still listening, which I doubt, because if any of you are that simple, simplistic about what you think this is about, you would not have been listening this long. I can assure you. <laughs> so another reason sometimes I have these long introductions with my patients is to make sure they can work with me. Because if a guy is this A-type personality that thinks this is all simplistic and they just want this over and done with quick, I'm not right for them, and they just need to have it ripped out by the urologist. You know, I need patients who are willing to really understand this concept and realize that this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. You know, it's a long process, and we have to define the terms, understand what we're talking about when we talk about cancer, about PSA, about mortality. What do you prefer, quality of life over longevity? Do you understand the terms? Are you compliant? We'll be able to track you over the next year or so to make sure your problem doesn't worsen. All of this. So to finish up, you know, what is the goal of treatment? Well, for a lot of guys, it's to get rid of the cancer. I will tell you that is not, in my opinion, should not be the goal of treatment. If it is, remove the prostate or nuke it or something else. And I can help you as a patient uh, find out what type of, uh, of radiation or surgery is right for the patient. You know, I'm, I'm able, to, I, I worked with all the top surgeons uh, through the years, you know, I, being an integrative doc. And so, you know, I can help guys match up what procedure is best for them, figuring out the risk of cancer that it could get out, how aggressive the treatment needs to be, and then also how important is quality of life versus longevity. All that you need to really understand when you're figuring out a type of surgery or radiation. But when guys want to go natural and they, or active surveillance and they say, well, I want to, I'll do these supplements until it's gone. Well, it's not going to be gone. You cannot prove it's gone. The PSA going under four, no doctor who's paying malpractice is going to tell you it's gone. And, no, no, and, the, and, the, with, and even if a biopsy is negative, they won't say it's gone. They missed it. So what is the goal? Well, here's what I would say. You have changed, you've turned the page. You've evolved to a proper advanced patient dealing with cancer that you could probably deal with it successfully as a patient if you change the goal to not killing the cancer but outliving the cancer 
outlive the cancer. If a patient calmly can get to that point, which they usually don't right away. You know, like I said, you go through the Jimmy Stewart vertigo stage, understandably, and you know, all the, 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 the uh, you know, all hell breaks out when you're diagnosed, and your wife finds out, and she's crying, and she's upset, and your kids might be yelling at you to get it ripped out, and you know, you've got your urologist you're screaming at you about your insurance, which you know might change next year, and whatever, all this other stuff that gets in the way. You know, what is really the goal? And maybe the goal is to outlive the cancer. To, if the goal for you is you're okay living with cancer, um, and, but you just don't want to die from it. If dying of a heart attack, having plenty of sex in Las Vegas is your idea of going out with a smile like Jack Nicholson Joker once said, if that is what your goal is, well, then let's make that the goal, not to die of the cancer. And as I said earlier, the number one cause of death of a man with prostate cancer is a heart attack anyway. So uh, not to be wry or making fun of this, but the goal really for me it, or for any urologist is for you to die on some other doctor's shift. <laughs> I know it sounds pretty wry and crass, but that's what it is. Yeah, I want you to die on the cardiologist's shift, not mine. So I want to keep you alive long enough so you, know, that you don't get, get hammered by it. And that really is the goal. You know, there's, there's a saying, you know, you and I are ch being chased by the bear. I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. And that, I think, for a lot of men, ultimately, is when they go work their way through this whole thing, that's what they come down to. It's how can I outlive this cancer? And I keep throwing all the money at it and everything in my nest egg and destroy it and IVs and all of this that for 20 years, you're not going to want to do that for 20 years. You won't have the money to do it for 20 years. But you need to figure out how can I pace myself like a marathon you know, where is the goal? How, when is my life expectancy? When will I probably die, uh, reasonably speaking? How much money do I have to throw at this thing? How quickly is this thing moving? You know, based off of the PSA density and the PSA velocity and the PSA pattern and the location of it, is it sticking out or not? And I even get into color Doppler, which I'm not to. I'm going to end this now. But color Doppler is, is my machine has a color Doppler function where when your heart beats, I can see the blood flow course through the prostate. So, you know, areas that have a high velocity of blood flow are being fed more. And guess what areas like to be fed more? Areas that are sick, either inflamed areas, growing areas, and cancerous areas. So, you know, if I see a lot of blood flow, this, this, this cancer is worsening. But anyway, I use all these metrics to make sure that cancer is not progressing, or if it is, that it's far away from the wall and other factors like the PAP and all to say, okay, it's progressing, but it doesn't seem to want to jump, to jump, uh, jump the shark or, you know, or, or, or you know, run for the exit sign yet, whatever analogy you want to use, that cancer is not getting out. Because as long as the cancer doesn't get out, then you never start the 10-year clock and you're, you're not going to, nothing's going to get you. And even if it does get out, then we look at your age and overall health and we try to, you know, we have to pace all this and figure out at what way with the minimum amount of money and, and, and concern on you can we still outrun this and you die of something else statistically. All right, gang, that's about it. Uh, my brain is shutting, shutting off. I've been up since 5 o'clock preparing for uh, the three-hour show and then, uh, and then for this. I hope this was helpful. Um, if it was, yeah, please drop a line to Freedoms Phoenix. Let, let Ernie know. And um, we're going to put up on this, on the uh, Freedoms Phoenix, uh, not just telling Ernie, but, you know, just letting Donna and the producer know uh, if this is helpful. And if so, maybe I can do another show like this sometime in the future, uh, even getting more involved in prostate or other medical issues. Uh, this is, I think, the first time I've been this intimate, <laughs> quote, unquote, with you guys uh, regarding uh, the world of prostate. Um, and this is pretty much uh, the realm. And, and on a quick note, uh, a side libertarian note, is that I created this. I was going to be a surgeon, a urologist, and I decided against it because I did not want to be part of the medical system that the Clintons, uh, you know, uh, were going to, you know, first start to make socialize. You guys remember that in the, in the 90s. Uh, I gave it up and wanted a way to become a doctor but not be beholden to the system. And that's why I gave up becoming a surgeon, not because I didn't have the grades to do it, but because I didn't want to be controlled by the system. You know, before I was a doctor, I used to do organ transplant harvesting. They would fly me around and I would take out hearts and eyes and femurs and dermatome skin for burn victims. So I've played in the hospitals for a long time before I was a doctor, believe it or not. I worked at Merck Pharmaceuticals doing phase four drug testing and then later on as a medical student actually i worked with mayo surgeons i said earlier top urologists here in arizona so that's what i mean by being bilingual here natural and conventional but uh but ultimately 
ultimately, uh, I chose this profession because it's uh, outside the system, and therefore I can take cash. And I only take cash. I've never taken insurance ever and will not take insurance. And I know that's probably, you know, not that I'm trying to be commercial for you guys, but those of you that are, might be wondering if I take it, uh, we don't, unfortunately, although I, we don't charge what a hospital would cash price. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, do have to cha- we do charge cash, A, because the, the medical system doesn't recognize me. They assume I'm a quack. They can't understand that I would understand what I just explained to you guys, too, for the last two hours. Um, you know, they think I'm supposed to be doing uh, color therapy and wave my hands over you with my chakra wheel or something. That's what they expect. That is not what naturopathic doctors in Arizona do. We are full uh, PCPs and integrative doctors and work hand-in-hand with with, uh, both sides, like I said. But um, we uh, cannot take uh, Medicare because Medicare is only for nationally approved doctors. Uh, which I agree with. Well, first of all, none of us want the government taking ever our money. That's another story. But if you're going to take the money, it should be distributed to something where all Americans agree on, you know, to give it to uh, states that naturopaths are licensed where other states they're not. That's unfair using people's tax money from those other states. So that's why we're not allowed to take any, any Medicare dollars. And that's fine with me because I don't want to take any of it because the minute you do, then I'm back to a five-minute visit. So everything I spent time talking today, I do review often with my students. Stu- uh, my students, my patients, who also become my students with this, and um, you know we figure it all out. So um, contact information, I it'll, we'll put it on uh, the website. You guys can find it. Um, we have uh, my I, my main office is called Longevity, but believe it or not, that one's shutting down after 35 years. So I'll be fo- uh, for, uh, focusing most of my patients uh, to two other offices. I have my main my new main office will be Rockwood Natural Medical Clinic. And that is in Scottsdale. It's across the street from North Scottsdale Hospital, for those of you who are local. Um, and you can, reach, just, you can find them online, uh, Rockwood Medical Health, or Natural Medical Clinic. And you put in my name, Tambori, Rockwood, Prostate, boom, it'll come up. And uh, you can, there's a lady, named, a lady there named Kathleen, who's my office manager there. And uh, if you guys want to see me very quickly, I'm here, in, this is February 2020, um, I am still at the Longevity office. That is the Longevity Medical Health Center in Phoenix. The phone number, that one I have memorized, actually, it's, it's 602-493-2273. Again, 602-493-2273. Ask for Katie. I'll, be, I'll only be there the next few months, though, if you happen to want. But that's my main office. You'll love it, guys. I have a big, I have a 4440 rifle in my office. How many doctors have a rifle in their medical office? So it's just right for this audience. But anyway, uh, that's the other office. And I have another office in Seattle. So if some of you happen to be in the Northwest, I, uh, I'm flown up there every few months to see patients in Seattle at the Tahoma Clinic, which is run by Dr. Jonathan Wright. And any of you who are up in the Northwest, you know Dr. Wright. He's pretty famous. He's Suzanne Summers' doctor, <laughs> claim the fame. Uh, he's the one that taught Suzanne Summers everything she knows about hormones. And he's a very famous Harvard medical doctor that fought the system. Oh, you guys would love Dr. Wright. He, uh, he's the only doc- he, he, he was arrested a number of times back in the day for giving patients vitamin C IVs which now every doctor does, but he was one of the first to push the envelope as a Harvard MD. So many natural people, we owe our, we owe our profession to someone like Dr. Wright, and he was busted by the feds a few times, and it's amazing. He's, he's a real libertarian. You guys would love him. He's got Thomas Jefferson sticking on, on his, uh, on, in, in his office when I visit him. You know, the guy's pretty well off. He has all sorts of companies, a very famous doctor, but, you know, he paid his dues early on. And there's a saying that you're not a true naturopath, Unless you've been arrested at least once. <laughs> That's because back in the day, they all fought the system. And Dr. Wright was one. Anyway, I'm just kind of getting a little plug to uh, Dr. Wright. Um, and when you go to his office, it's funny, a lot of the doctors, uh, they like to hide. If they got in trouble, they hide it. When you see Dr. Wright, he's got plastered on a mural outside of his office all the times that the feds came in and he battled them. And he has a T-shirt that says, I was raided by the FDA and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. I mean, it's great. And he's brilliant. This man is brilliant. He's got like a one-year waiting list to go see him. Uh, but anyway, these are the doctors I associate with, these different offices. And if you're up northwest, uh, the Tahoma Clinic, you just call them 
them up, ask for Dr. Tambori, and that's the other. And I'm thinking of going solo as well. I'm talking to you guys a little more intimate because you're kind of my audience. But um, I'm th- probably going to be going solo at some point uh, because what I do is pretty low maintenance. It's I don't need a giant office. And so uh, with times of change, and I probably will. So, But it's, wh- whenever you listen to this, uh, just Google me. You'll eventually find me around, uh, and most doctors know where I'm at <laughs> somewhere. All right. That is way too much. Uh, 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 Donna is going to put up some articles. So the last thing is I write for a journal, a naturopathic journal called Naturopathic Doctor News and Review. They put out an, uh, every month. It's a journal article for the profession. Every year in November, they have the men's health issue. And uh, I've been honored. They've asked me to write the cover story for it every year for the last 12 years now. And um, each year, it's, it's meant for doctors, but the last three years, I wrote these articles not just for my fellow comrade doctors, but for my educated patient base. So I'm going to now finally end on this. These articles are all going to be put on Freedoms Phoenix. They're going to be uh, linked to uh, this podcast and maybe another site. If you know, Ernie's, you know, I'm sure he'll help me out and maybe put a different page if you guys are looking for prostate information. Um, check out these articles. They're a bit deep. They're meant for doctors and educated patients, but check them out. The first article is asking, what is aggression? When we talk about prostate cancer, the first thing guys say is, well, is it aggressive or not? Well, what does aggression mean? It's a biopsy, but if you don't want a biopsy, then how do we determine what aggression is? Well, read that article. It'll make much more sense uh, right off the bat. The second article is, when do I pull the ripcord? Okay, so if there is prostate cancer, well, how long can I live with it before I have to get, you know, you know before I have to see a real doctor, <laughs> so to speak? Um, and we covered a little bit of that, a, a little bit of that today, you know, the PSA density, the PAP, the T status, but there's other components. Uh, much of it also is you looking in the mirror, you know, understanding what's important, longevity of life or quality of life. And the third article it just came out this last november uh that's the first one it wasn't on the front page strangely enough i got i got in late because of the move i had this year but anyway that one is about mri imaging about imaging in general but it's explaining why mri imaging is not the bee's knees that many people think it is it's very good to have imaging but you have to know how to use it and i talked about that a little bit today as well about you know doctors going well i see a black spot well so what well that whole discussion i'm a little it's a little more detailed but um, uh, talks about that, that, that scenario and the quandary that guys get caught in with that. So those three articles, if you're really just looking for own information, uh, read them, and you will be, uh, you'll know more than probably your urologist, and I almost mean that, when it comes to prostate cancer risk assessment and in- interpreting PSAs and understanding what prostate cancer the game is all about. Uh, hopefully it'll help you out. And don't forget that book, Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers, which comes from a patient's perspective. So check all that out. Uh, you have my information from my offices. You have this, you listen to this, this whole video again if you like. And I, trust me, if you hear it a second time, you're probably tired of my voice. But much more of this will make sense the more you hear it. Uh, and eventually the light bulb will go on. And ultimately, guys, my job isn't to treat you. My job is not to sell you some salt palmetto and make a few bucks. No, no, no. My job is to empower you. That's my goal. Because even if you decide to do something, whatever it is, surgery, no surgery, maybe the cancer gets out, maybe it doesn't, maybe you have side effects, maybe you don't. But you know what I've learned? It doesn't matter how bad something might turn out. As long as the patient made the choice on their own rightfully and they had all their options in front of them and they made an educated decision. I've never found a patient to be angry by that. All right. The guys that are angry are the ones that have only like 5% you know, erectile dysfunction, hardly anything to it, but it was a surgery that was thrust on them where they never had a choice. That small amount of a side effect, men will be ticked off for years and really, really angry, not because of the side effect as much as the fact that they didn't have a choice at it. Whereas guys could have really bad outcomes, as an example, not that it happens much in my office, but it's the empowerment. It's that you made the choice. That's what I'm selling. It's putting you back in the driver's seat so you can make, the, make an educated decision because the, God knows the system doesn't want you to. They don't want you to think. They don't want you to ask questions. They don't have time for you to think or ask questions. Um, they want you just to go through the, through, through the cattle chute and get to the next patient because the system is that broken, and this audience certainly knows that. So that is pretty much what uh, I'm going to end on. 
Have yourself a great day, and thanks for listening this this long. Um, it's nice it's after four or five years on the show. It's the first time I've ever done this, so um, that's why it went pretty long, but uh, should be it. All right, Godspeed and prostate health greetings and goodbyes to you.